Razor Friday, FT Live, but next week we will all be together in person if Flavor Phrase is feeling better. Todd, we're how getting, you doing, man? We're getting there. We're getting there. Still got a little cough going, but hey, that's life, baby. I got a little more sleep last night. I got my nebulizer going still. We're getting there, baby. It takes some time. I, I need him better, Kratzy, for next week. We're all crashing the party at, at Fraser's spot. I'll be there with you for the first time. We'll do the show. Us three. None of the box. There'll be one box. It'll have all of us in there um, at Fraser Friday. If we if we get that cough, we might be putting a box ah. six feet under. No worries. No worries. It's just it's just loud noise. That's all it is. No problem. Got that really little sauna that I might have to hide out in, Kratzy, and like go in uh, quarantine or something at Fraser's. Get a little antioxidants. Get the sweat out. I get it, Todd. You need to get in there. <laughs> I have. I have. Trust me. I'm, I'm, I'm nonstop with it. I feel you. We're not worrying about it anymore. If it happens, it happens. That's life. Let's get going, baby. Let's do this. So we have Ross Stripling joining us, San Francisco Giants starter. Had a great year also last year with Toronto. Matt Barnes, reliever now for the Miami Marlins. I think that's one of those guys that if you were snoozing, at times in the offseason, you look up and Kratz, you're like, oh, Matt Barnes is a Marlin now? What happened? So we'll talk to him. Yep. And Ken that. Rosenthal. Ken Rosenthal joining us as well, as usual, a couple times a week. Excited to have him on. Um, and Fraze, I was told that you have something for us. Is this true? Before we get into top news of the day? Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, and I don't know what it is, but I was told give Fraze a second. So go for it. It's all you. I'm just going to leave it at this. This is what would happen between Eric and I, if there was ever a play at the plate, I would dupe Eric and um, just, we just got to roll with it because this is something that would happen. I would, you know, the jersey would come out of me and I would make him mess up and then I'd be safe at home. So if we can run this video, Eric, Scotty, take a look. This is me rounding third. Boom, get around the tag. I don't know what to do next. Look, oh look, somebody's over there at the right. Oh, got him. Oh, so, wow. Unbelievable. I saw this video the other day. The girl did a heck of a job getting around the tag for one. Now, all you got to do is sit on home plate, right, Eric? Just sit there. Huh. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I guess you can just sit there, but in the moment, you're like, well, I'm not going to sit there. There's no way. Like, just walk up to her and tag her. I, I mean, simple right. as that. I know, there's some, I know there's some super softball dad out there. It's like, no, no, no. Out of the baseline, out of the baseline. Like, look, it's, Eric, look, look to your right, real quick. Oh, yeah, got him. <laughs> <laughs> Who did it? Who did it? Not that exact move, but Josh Harrison probably had the best uh, yes. sneaky deke left and right, and then get into the bag on a rundown. But if you're just listening to the audio podcast style, basically had a softball game where. There was, I guess, a play at the plate. The play at the plate, though, was a point to first and then eventually getting on uh, home plate oh, without why, getting Why touched. is the catcher looking over there like something happened? I, it was just kind of comical, too, at the same time. Something that, you know, she'll probably – it'll never happen to that catcher again. So it was just a funny segment. And she was in there. Safe. Safe. Got, got in there. I had one play right around the whole, like, no collision time. In triple A, a dude was coming running in and was dead out. And he just kind of like, kind of just like slowly started jogging in like it was going to be like a tag play. And fortunately, I still went to tag him hard because right at the end, he just tried to like zip, slide underneath. Yeah. Oh, that would have been bad, bad. Because about a uh, month, I was going to say a week, probably more like a month later, Somebody got somebody in AAA, and it went. The video went viral. It would. I was like, mm. "Thank goodness it wasn't me. It was no, almost no. me." Were, were you guys um, physical taggers? Does that make sense? You know, some guys kind of smoothly do it, and some kind of really push it on the guy's chest or wherever it's going. Especially with the video replay. So when I caught the ball, if I had a time to take a step. Out from third base and come up, I was being firm because you got guys like Javi Baez going zippity-doo, you know, 
doing all these weird things. And somebody got me one time with the, with the right hand, went to tag right, and he came left. They reviewed it, and he was safe. I said, that'll never happen to me again. It's emb- That's more embarrassing to me than making an error and stuff like that. So I, I said, I can't let that happen again. Yeah, I'm dropping a shin guard. Mm-hmm. I'm just dropping it. I mean, I, I, have, <laughs> I have a little bit, you know, at home, it's different. You know, Todd's coming to cover the bag usually. They're shifting. You're moving the play. You're moving into play. But for me, I'm anchored at home. You know, I'm taking one step drop and I'm sliding like you're not. But I wasn't afraid of contact either. So I didn't yeah. like the no collision rule. But, you know, you have shin guards on. I'm I'm not getting swim moved. That's for sure. No. Eric, let me ask you this. Have you, well, you have the protective guards. Have you ever, ha, ever have anybody slide on, hit your toe and, like, knock a toenail off before? Uh, off of my toe? Yes. No. That happened to me two times. They slid either. I get shit. I get cleated in the shin or for some reason my toe gets slid into and then a week later the big toenail just fell off. Nothing. Not, not a toenail, but I ripped. Ridiculous. I, in AAA, I ripped. I got slid into and it ripped like a quarter size hole in my shoe, in my cleat. Yes. And from that been day there. on, I took two cleats to every game. Yep. Been there wow. before too. Sure. Hey, this is non-contact for a few minutes, and then we'll bring in Ken Rosenthal for more on it. Devastating injury yesterday. We actually spoke to Rob Thompson, Philly skipper, on our show. Then, like, an hour and a half later, um, non-contact injury, left knee issue for Reese Hoskins. You immediately knew there was going to be an issue, and it ended up being kind of the worst news. A torn ACL. He's out for the season. So there's two layers here. One is for the Phillies. It sucks. It was a huge part of their team for a long time. And this might be the end of his career with the Phillies. He's going to be a free agent after the season. Also for the Phillies and looking at their lineup, they lose a little bit of depth, of course, and a big part of their lineup in a variety of ways, including the clutchness that he brought to the table for this team. And then for the person, next year will be his age 31 season when he's back. It's going to be free agent after this year. It's something you look forward to for a long time. So just sucks. People in Philadelphia are pissed. Like this is a team that did a lot in the offseason coming off uh, basically a second place finish, right? You had Trey Turner, you had Taiwan Walker, some bullpen help like Soto. Kratzy, what's the vibe in Philadelphia right now? You're in the area. Devastating. It was all over the radio this morning, taking the kids to school. You heard it. It's it's tough because the guy is the you know, he's he's the longest tenured Philly. He was drafted by the Phillies. He has had incredible success with the Phillies. Like when you look at his numbers, and I I really wanted to wanted to dive into his numbers when you know when we get to the Phillies and and this is gonna be a tough, you know, a huge loss for him. If there's anything, there's so many layers to peel back here. If there's anything that's good. First base, while not just anybody can play first, it is a position where you can start to find places, people to fill in. They have a guy in the minor leagues, Derek Hall, who came up and filled in awesome. Nine homers and like 130 at-bats with like an 800 OPS, 804 OPS. But like it's devastating. For for him as a person, like – he was about to get paid. I, I, w- I would have put his number right around what Schwarber got. His numbers are better than Schwarber going into his free agent year, I think a year to a year and a half older. So he might not have gotten the same years. But, I mean, this guy, he it's devastating. It was such a weird, weird thing, too, how it happened. Uh, I'm – and how sad this is, but now it's like, all right, you know, who, who is going to replace him? You got Alec Baum that can go over there too as well. Um, it's, it's one of those positions where it's, it's hard to master, but at the same time, it's about footwork. And guys that can move their feet well are going to pretty, pretty much be better first basemen for it. Uh, you want a tall body over there. Reese is a tall body. Alec is a tall body. Um, I don't know how tall the guy is that you were talking about before. But still, um, you, you want a bigger guy over there. And I think, you know, they're going to have a couple opportunities to put a couple guys over there. And then how do you maneuver putting a guy at third base or whatever they want to do? So 
it's a tricky situation. Scott, we talk about it all the time. Wait until the end of spring training is over. Um, feel for the guy, man, because he's a great dude. I wish the best for him. And, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, Phillies can pick it up, too. So a few things. One, Derek Hall, who's the guy who Kratzy's talking about who might replace him. Yeah, he's a big dude for age. 6'4", 232. Perfect. He's a truck. He's, he's a also tall, He's a yeah. tall 6'4", too. Oh. Yeah? Okay. You know, some people are taller. Like, I always say Jose Reyes, tall 6'3". Mm -hmm. Also, you know what that means to me sometimes, Kratzy? A real 6'4". Because sometimes a 6'1 yeah. turns into a 6'4", and I'm like, this dude's 6'4"? <laughs> hey, I used to put in my like? high school basketball program, I put another inch taller because it just sounded better. So, <laughs> If, was, if I, you don't, you you feel small because then you'll be standing next. Like, what what are you, Fraser? You're 6'3"? Three? 6'3", three, but I, I would put 6'4". Uh, just because I was the I was the tallest guy on the court on my team at all times, so I'd had to, you know, when I face a six 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 eight guy, all right, well I got one more inch. What the heck's that gonna do? But Fraser's whatever. a tall six three. Fraser's a tall six three. He yeah. is a tall six three. You I get, agree. You get the higher shoe, so that's another inch. You got to add that. He mm -hmm. likes the four and a half too. Just saying. <laughs> Love Don't it. start. Don't start. Uh, Hall, by the way, crushing the baseball in spring training too. And this is his shot. Like this is this his is moment. Shot. Put We've him seen in. it. Yeah. Put him, Put him in. Let's go. OPS above a thousand in uh, fifty-two plate appearances this spring. He's twenty-seven, and this is his opportunity. It's happened. Hey, first base has always been interesting in Philadelphia, Kratzy. Right? Um, Ryan Howard was sitting behind Jim Tomey for a while, and you're like, this dude's about to rake, and he had to wait. I mean, I think Ryan Howard didn't really hit the scene hard until. 24, 25? Am I, do I sound yeah. right there? No, you're, you're exactly right. And, you know, he was an older rookie. You know, then he wins MVP, and he was the premier first baseman at the time. I think Adrian Gonzalez and him were kind of the kind of guys through that time. Uh, it's, it's crazy to think, like, then Reese came up and took Howie's spot. I think there might have been, like, a year or two in between them. And, you know, so you pretty much had two first basemen since 2006, and both were drafted by the Phillies, and both have had incredible careers. Reese's career is kind of on the same line as, like, Pat Burrell, who ended up winning the World Series in his last year in Philly, and Reese and, Reese and Pat's numbers were very similar. You know, his, his knock in Philly is his streakiness, but... I'll take streakiness when a dude gets on base and has a career 830 OPS. Hey, Ryan Howard's first full season was 2006 when he had over 700 plate appearances. The year before was about a half a season, and he was great the year before. But his first full season was his age 26 season. He, he hit 58 wow. homers and drove in 149. So. That's decent. Yeah, that, that's decent. But you know, I mean, you come into the league, there's some guys that make everyone else look bad, like a Soto or an Acuna, where they're amazing from the jump. But there's plenty of guys that struggle or have to find themselves, even if they're going to be a star. So for Derek Hall, you come into the league, you've been around for a while now, you're 27 years old, might be the perfect opportunity for someone like him. Plus, we, we mentioned Boehm can definitely handle some first. My one thing, and we'll ask Ken about this too, Kratzy, is – it sucks for the person because he was waiting for free agency. First basemen don't always get paid the same amount. It's 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 a little iffy. Besides, like a Freddie Freeman, you know, obviously Vado's still riding that huge deal. Schwarber signed for four years, seventy nine mil. I don't think he was going to get to that kind of level. Only because you know who I always look at is is Frazier's guy Rizzo. Anthony Rizzo is a, is a great player, but but first base dings him a little bit in terms of his contracts and his age to an extent, but. It's not like you know he he hasn't had a monster contract. No, but I would say I would say Reese was in line for three. If if you were to give me the over under, I'd say three for fifty five. Yep, I like that. But Ken I like that. Know. Ken's Ken's the guy. He knows all that stuff. Praise. What do you think for Reese Hoskins? Because your guy Rizzo, and I'll look up some of his money. I mean, now now Riz, I think is what thirty three. Two for thirty three. I think he yeah. Got. I, I, Two for 40, but 40. I'm saying what, what age he is. I think he's... He's 33. 33? Yeah. That's what I was so he, he's on a two for 40. Yeah, he is. He's 33 years old. He'll turn and 34 numbers in are August. a little better than his. And but Rizzo's, right a, hitter. Rizzo's a much better defender. Agreed. Yeah, and a, yeah I, I would agree. 
I would agree on that 100%. Um, I mean, you're paying for defense. Yeah, I, I guess you're right in a way. A little um, bit, a little bit. There, there's some yeah. first basemen that stand out. Haas? Uh, Goldschmidt? Yeah. Goldschmidt changed the complexion of the Cardinals defense. Fair. You watch the Cardinals pre Goldschmidt. I mean, he, the amount of picks he makes, and there's a few others that are like him, but he stood out because there were some good defenders on St. Louis, and all of a sudden the year he pops up on the team, you're like, whoa, those defenders are way better. Yeah, no shit. Because all the balls that are hitting the dirt are ended up in a glove. Goldie was a stolen base. He could steal too. I mean, how much does that pay? I mean, I don't, not, not a hundred percent sure if that's, you know, going to help as much, but yeah, that, that's part of it. But yeah, I could see around 350. Yeah. Three years, 50 million for him for sure. Um, Yeah. But yeah, it, you're right about the market for first baseman. And that one year when had what Prince Fielder, Albert Pujols, Joey Votto is like, wow, the money was just going crazy. I remember Votto going through that. And when they got him that, I'm like, dude, I need to go to first base for a little bit, man. This this is insane. <laughs> but um, yeah, it but right now, I, I yeah, they're kind of middle middle of the, the round here right now. So it just it just stinks, man. Any injury stinks, and for this for him, especially going in free agent year, God Almighty, you feel for the guy right now. Hey, let's bring in our senior insider Ken Rosenthal joining us right now with the post World Baseball Classic hangover. He's back home. First off, we'll get into Hoskins in a second. Ken, welcome back home. How does it feel for a few days? Spring training tour and then World Baseball Classic. It's been a minute. Does your family recognize you? Yeah, they recognize me and. Scott, I don't want to talk too much about how hard I might have been working because, of course, AJ will perceive that as complaining about my job. So let's just celebrate everything about my job. It's great. <laughs> yes. Hey, you had a Craig, fun you run. missed this the other day, man. AJ completely took words out of context, kind of as he did as a player when I was covering him. <laughs> but, you know, that's how he rolls. So whatever. Unbelievable. <laughs> Phrase deals with it every day. AJ and Frazier before the show is going to turn into its own show at some point. Those two going at it before we even start. So, you know, Ken, luckily, Ken, we gave you a break today because there's no AJ. Go ahead, Frazier. Ken, I, I want to jump into something here, man. We talk about baseball all the time. I want to ask you, like, kind of a personal question. How, how, do, you, how do you become an insider? How, is there, like, is there something that you do? Like, I know you go to school, you, 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 you work on everything, but was there one, you know, Thing that you got you got trust from one person or next thing you know boom I know you, you you worked all around you worked in different spots but you were good and then all of a sudden you become that guy like was there a certain something that happened or you know does it you know just naturally come to you actually Todd I was at the Baltimore Sun from 91 to 2000 actually from 87 to 2000 first I covered the Orioles as a beat person for four years then I was a general sports columnist for nine. So I wrote about all the sports, but Baltimore really had baseball. The Ravens came in the middle of that, but the Orioles were the biggest thing. So in the year 2000, I was kind of not restless, but I was maybe looking for some other things. And my wife, of all people, noticed one day, I think it was Jason Stark, but it might have been Tim Kirkchen. She noticed him, one of those guys, on ESPN. And she goes, hey, you, you were with those guys. You're the same kind of age, whatever. Why can't you do what they do? It had never even occurred to me before. But I started looking around for what is called a national job, not just covering one team, but a lot of different teams, all the different teams. And my sales pitch for that job, which I eventually got at the Sporting News, was the Orioles at the time under Peter Angelos, who was their owner then and now, ran through executives like you can't believe. So it was Pat Gillick, it was Kevin Malone, Doug Melvin, Dan O'Dowd, a lot of these guys, Frank Wren was another one, they had branched out to other teams, and I covered them with the Orioles. So I knew them all. So that was my starting point and kind of my foundation for getting to know different people in the game. I would talk to them, and then obviously once you start covering all the different teams, you meet different people and players. So that was kind of it. If, it. if the Orioles were not such a mess in the 1990s, maybe I would not have this job and be <laughs> where I am today. I don't know. Yeah. But that helped. Yeah, so that, that kind of goes back to our conversation. Like, are you cheering for a bad team or a good team? So if they were bad, that really worked out for you, right? Yeah, but I didn't know, Eric. I, I had no idea 
that I was even going to look into that kind of job. It, it did not even occur to me really until my wife said something. And well, good for her. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> she she kind of saw she saw the field better than I did. I I was kind of probably thinking I'd be at the Baltimore Sun forever and just being a columnist. And hey, at that time, that was a very good job to have, and I would I was perfectly happy. So. It really was that more than anything, and it was the fact that all of these different people had been through Baltimore that enabled me to tell the sporting news, hey, I have obviously not the experience doing this that other people do, but I have this foundation of these people. I can start there and go from that point. And you're a good dude. You didn't say that. You're reliable. That's that's a huge part of it, but... <laughs> You know, this Thanks. This is your segment, so we've given you enough praise because... Yeah, yeah, enough, Eric. Let's AJ go. texted us. <laughs> AJ texted me, and he said he's listening. So he just wants you to know. He said, I heard that, Ken. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. he's, heard okay, a lot good. Of, he's heard a lot of things from me. He's going to hear a lot more. Good, 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 good. <laughs> hey, uh, what are you hearing from Philly's camp? What, what with, with the Hoskins injury, you know, just kind of kind of delve into that awful situation first off i heard what you guys were talking about relative to his free agency and i'll start there because i spoke with him a couple of weeks ago about this and he loves philly he wants to be in philly and whether that was going to happen or not who knows but this clearly changes the equation and eric i think it was you that made the point that you can make the case his numbers are better than schwarber's at a comparable stage of his career he's a little bit older and that's true the defense has been and was certainly going to be a problem in free agency. Now, you could say Schwarber has the same problem, but he plays the outfield. It's not great, maybe, but it's okay. Hoskins, at first, has not been a great defender. So that might have played into it. But this really, it's such a shame because this was the time when he was going to, of course, be pushing for that big deal. And you guys are right. The Schwarber comparison, the Rizzo comparison, these are all fair guys to look at. So from a personal standpoint, from Reese Hop Hoskins' career, that is a really difficult thing. For the Phillies, yes, it's also difficult. Now, they do have options. Hall is one of these guys that kind of came up last year, made a strong impression, didn't look like he had a spot with the Phillies because they're kind of loaded in the corner infield positions, D.H., but here he is, and he'll get an opportunity. They also can slide Bohm over, but if I were the Phillies, given the improvements Bohm has made at third base and how hard he has worked at that position, I'd be reluctant to do that. And I would look at Hall, and at that point, come the deadline, if indeed this is a problem with production, then maybe you go out and look around. First base types usually are somewhat available. It's not like a position of scarcity. You can find different guys to do that. It's not a devastating blow for them, but it doesn't help, especially when you don't have Harper to start the season. And they were so excited about their team. And that infield of Hoskins, Stott, Turner, and Bohm looked like it was going to be really good. Now they've got to patch it together a little bit, and it's more of a challenge. But you have to say this, and it, as cold as it sounds, and you guys know this, Every team will go through this at some point in the season. Every contender is going to have a major injury or two. Dodgers with Lux already. The Mets with Diaz. I mean, we can go right down the line, and it, the season hasn't even started yet. So it's part of it. It's the worst part of it. It's an unfortunate thing, no question. But from the Phillies' perspective, I think they'll be okay. From Hoskins' perspective, it's more disappointing because of the free agent aspect. You mentioned you mentioned Harper real quick. Should we we asked uh, we asked Topper yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday he was on. Is is there any significance to the whole sixty day? You know, didn't put him on the sixty day when other teams are putting all their guys on sixty days. I didn't think so. Okay. And Dave Dombrowski's explanation was, we don't need to do this just yet. So why not leave your options open? Clearly. If at some point they feel Harper is moving along more quickly and, yes, it can justify not putting him on the 60-day, I get it. But I just, Eric, did not see that as anything more than if they don't need to do it, why do it? And yeah. if there comes a point when they need to do it, they'll do it then. I don't expect him back 
within yeah. 60 days. I think that's a fantasy. That's the one thing that starts that up, though, Ken, is that they're going to miss Harper for about half the season. So from an offensive firepower perspective, yeah, Tr- Trey Turner looks like he's on top of the world, but down Hoskins, down Harper, that hurts to start the year. And the one thing I wanted to get from you, we've talked about this in the past, I mean, we've worked together for a long time, is the annual reminder, it's time, that trades during this time period rarely happen, trades of significance, because you see those big injuries, like this one with Reese, especially Edwin Diaz a week and a half ago, and Mets fans calling out Alexis Diaz and David Bednar and all these closers on bad teams. That does not mean that's going to happen. So do you want to give your yearly PSA on why trades like this are incredibly rare at this time? They are rare, and it's not that they're unheard of. The Padres have done it a few times, the Kimbrel trade that one year, but it's just really difficult because teams are not willing to give up prospects at this point for the most part. And let's say in the Reds' case, they don't want to give up Diaz and kill whatever minimal hope they have going into the season before the season starts. So it's just a difficult thing to pull off. Granted, with 40-man roster decisions that will be coming, different guys getting bumped off, you could see the Phillies maybe make a claim on someone or maybe get someone in a lesser trade. But I don't expect anything major. Now, that said, I'm not going to rule it out completely, especially in the Mets case. But it's just tough, Scott. I, it's just not the time of year when teams are generally inclined to do things. And you could say that really right up until about July 15th. Because the way the calendar works, the way teams think, they're just not inclined to push right now. They more likely will want to see what they have and kind of see how it plays out the first couple of months before making a decision. Hey, Ken, I want you to pretend right now, okay? You and me, we're at a bar here in Jersey. We're just shooting the shit, all right? So (laughs) talking baseball, I'm going to bring up a situation about Chris Russo, his comments about the World Baseball Classic. You know, I'm, I'm friends with Chris. You know, me and him bumped heads back in the day. I still think some of his takes are bad. You know, he's, he's commented on some of my fourth. But give me your take on that, man. I mean, he just comes up with this asinine comment about, you know, basically, you know, what, what, why are people even excited about this matchup between Shohei and Trout? I mean, I thought, in my opinion, if you're a baseball fan, this is one of the most spectacular things you're going to see in baseball probably this year. Um, and he comes up with this just crazy ass take, man. What 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 would you what would you say on that behalf? Well, Todd, I am friends with Chris too, and I like Chris a whole lot. I think he's actually great at his job. I do think he missed here. And yeah. listen, Chris is a contrarian. He's a guy who does like to stir it up. That's kind of who he is. It's always who he has been. And no one should be surprised that he might have an outlandish take. That's the one thing I'm like looking at. All this criticism, like, really, Chris Russo, you're shocked that he's yeah. going to have some crazy number or now, crazy yeah. thought. Yeah. But with regard to this specific thing that he said, I don't agree at all. And actually, that moment was a completely special moment. It's amazing that it actually happened, given the odds of Otani facing Trout with the game on the line in the ninth inning. You couldn't have scripted it any better. And yet, In baseball, we rarely see this kind of thing take place. Really, rarely do we envision something and dream of something like that and see it happen just because of the different things that can transpire over the course of a game to disrupt it. So I don't know where he was coming from with that. Chris does love baseball. It's not a question of that, but I just believe he was off here. And again, someone like me, I like different opinions and I encourage people and welcome all kinds of points of view. I think that's healthy. I think that's what we need in baseball and everywhere else. But yeah. that opinion, I just felt it was off. Let's say you didn't feel like it was off and that he was correct. What's the second best? What's the second best uh, matchup that you've ever seen? Because you, you follow baseball for a long time. Well, I was at the game in 1988 when Gibson hit the home run. And I'll tell you a funny story about that. There's a man in Los Angeles, a radio guy. I don't know his name. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't recall his name. 
We're in the press box, the main press box at Dodger Stadium, which is the same today as it was then, okay, 35 years later. And we're crammed in. It's it's a tight fit. And Gibson's hobbling to the plate, and this guy says to me, radio guy, well, you know, newspaper guys don't respect radio guys as much as they respect newspaper guys. I'll lay that <laughs> out there. Uh, so he says, wouldn't it be great if Kirk Gibson hit a home run right here. And I'm not all that experienced at that point, but I say to him, pal, he ain't hitting a home run here. There's no freaking way he's hitting a home run here. And the words were out of my lips when, of course, he hit the home run, and it was one of the great things any of us will ever see. So that's the one that definitely stands out to me, Eric, as the best matchup. Now, Trout versus Otani, obviously different circumstances. And this was one of Chris's points. It's not Gibson Eckersley. I know it's not the World Series. We all know it's not the World Series. But the WBC was a great event. It ended with this incredible matchup. Teammates, the two best players in the game. I I don't know how you can want anything more. And the other thing was, and I wrote this, we didn't see a first pitch pop up here. We saw a (laughs) seven-pitch at bat that was really a fight. Now, it's funny. I wrote that. That it was battle or fight, whatever. And fans were like, well, Trail wasn't even hit, making contact. Yeah, he wasn't making contact because Otani was throwing ridiculously hard and then threw that slider at the end. You think Trout wasn't trying? I mean, really. So <laughs> it was a great battle, and it was a tremendous moment to end a tremendous tournament. And 97, 98% of the people watching probably felt the same way, and Chris was in the 1%, not. Yeah, and you're entitled to your own opinion, and I've known Chris for years, too, and I would tell him, first off, you need to go to a game. I guarantee you he has not been to a World Baseball Classic game. If he goes down to Miami and checks out that scene, he'd be like, holy shit. And if you don't feel that way, there's a problem. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited, saying, oh, I'm not going to get pumped in March, why? We can't have fun in March? Who said that? I mean, is that (laughs) something that was set in stone? Is it a law? Sorry that we had one of the coolest moments that we've been anticipating for a while, The top two maybe talked about players over the past decade plus in our sport facing off. I mean, what could be better? In my mind, that's the only thing. You're entitled to your opinion, but if it's a bad one, we can dunk on it. Well, that's true, of course. But it's also true what you're saying there, that if you don't like the WBC because in your head, your player on your team might get affected, whatever, okay. But what I've said from the beginning, I've said it on this show too, watch the games. Watch the games and tell me it's not a fun event. And that was true going into this WBC. This WBC was elevated beyond anything before. But the games are so good. And I think I said this the other day, guys. Four of the best games I've ever seen took place in this live. And there also is a greater good here. And the growth of the sport is meaningful. That's something important. Now, I know it doesn't affect the Mets if you're a Mets fan. And Edwin Diaz, I I get it, all that. But my gosh, if you couldn't appreciate this as a baseball fan, and Chris Russo is a baseball fan, if you couldn't appreciate what the tournament was and what that moment was, then I kind of question if you're seeing the sport the right way. Completely well said. Questioning the fandom there. So let's get back to spring training action and some competitions. There's two we want to hit on. So let's start with the Atlanta Braves because the competition is over and Braves country was freaking out. It was during the WBC, so it was hidden a little bit. We had Michael Harris on yesterday and he's roommates with Vaughn. They're good friends for years. He gave us a little bit of insight of how Vaughn's been very positive about it and says, hey, I'm going to come up soon. It's all good. And Michael Harris is about as straight up nice and positive as a guy as you'll meet. So that's a good guy to be around to kind of just play normal with his buddy, but still a little awkward for him. And for Braves fans, they're not pleased about it, at least at the moment. But what were you hearing about Grissom and um, his chances of coming up with the team pretty soon? Well, a couple of things here. So all winter long, actually not all winter long, but starting in January, I believe, Ron Washington had Vaughn Grissom at his home in New Orleans And he was working with Grissom. Now, Washington is one of the great infield coaches ever. Not just of this time, but ever. And he was confident that Grissom was going to get it. Now, when I went to Braves camp in early, eh, mid-February, I would say, early on in spring training, 
Some of the coaches were saying, hey, watch out for Arcia. Arcia is a good shortstop. He, we would be fine if he was a shortstop. They weren't commenting at all on Grissom in that regard. They were just saying, hey, Arcia is legit. So it seems, and I haven't been at that camp since then, but it seems to me that Grissom's range is, no matter how much Washington might work with him, going to be a problem. He's maybe not physically a shortstop. So that's why, or that's the genesis of this decision. Now, there's another factor here, and it's the kid Shoemake. And he is a great defender. And I read Mark Bowman of MLB.com, who's covered the Braves for years, wrote yesterday, he believes Shoemake's going to make the most starts at shortstop this season for the Braves, with Grissom kind of bouncing around. So what the Braves, it seems, are trying to do here is just give themselves the best chance out of the gate, see if Shoemake can develop a little bit more offensively, and maybe see if Grissom can develop a little bit more defensively. But I'm not sure Grissom is ever going to be a shortstop. And that's not a knock on him as a player. It just might not be who he is. And I remember last year this discussion was going on because Dansby Swanson was a free agent. And Braves fans like, well, Grissom's playing short in the minor leagues. He'll be fine. Yeah, I get it. Major League's a little bit different story. So not going to rule him out. No one should rule him out. Kid has a great work ethic. He's a good kid. And he wants it. But it might just be that that's not his spot. Hey, Ken, I'm going to move to a different shortstop position now. Uh, let's let's move to the Yankees. So I, I'm going to be working 20, 30 games with them uh, with the Yes Network here for pre and post game, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'm probably going to lean on you a little bit during the season here. If, if you, I might be blowing up your phone, but Volpe, let's talk about him a little bit, man. He's impressed all through spring training. Um, they're moving IKF around a little bit. Um, what have you heard about that? We got kind of got an inkling from from uh, Boone the other day uh, that, you know, he might be making the team and he might be that shortstop. So what, what are your thoughts and what have you heard about that? Ty, this is really interesting. This is one of the more fascinating decisions we're going to see toward the end of the spring, and not just because it's the Yankees. It's, it's just a really fascinating decision at this point in time in the game, and I'll tell you why. Last year with the new CBA, we had something come out in the CBA called a Prospect Promotion Initiative, PPI. If you carry a guy, a rookie, the whole year, he's a top 100 prospect on two lists, he stays with you the whole year, and he wins Rookie of the Year, or in his first three years, top three MVP or top three Cy Young, he gets you a draft pick. Seattle Mariners, Julio Rodriguez, they promote him from the start of the year last year. They've got the 29th pick in the draft because he won Rookie of the Year. That's a powerful incentive. Now, wow. if you bring up Volpe and you have him as your shortstop from day one, does it guarantee he's going to win Rookie of the Year? Of course not. But there's another layer here with the New York Yankees. It's a team that is hell-bent on winning the World Series for the first time since 2009. Always claims that they're all about winning. And in most regards, you can't really argue with that. They're going to send down a guy who seems, from everything I hear, to have the support of his clubhouse support of certain people in the front office, and in many ways should be the guy because he has clearly outplayed Peraza in this spring training competition. And spring training competitions, as you guys both know, can be a bit of a mirage and BS, eyewash. But if you're saying you have a competition, one guy outplays the other, and you're claiming you're all about winning, then what is the justification for sending Volpe down other than service time manipulation, and giving Peraza maybe one last shot to hold this thing down before Volpe comes up and is the guy. There's a lot there. There's a lot there, and if you're the Yankees, maybe you want the extra year of control, you keep them down until April 22nd, but if you're the Yankees, you shouldn't care about that because, my gosh, you should be able to retain Anthony Volpe even if he is eligible for free agency a year sooner. So all of these different things are coming into play. The fact also, Volpe has not played at AAA. That's part of this equation. It's just a really interesting decision to me. And I am quite intrigued to see where the Yankees go with it. Yeah, hey, there's going to be some news either way. So, And Yankee fans are already convinced, solid. They are ready for Volpe, and if they don't see him, they're going to freak out, especially if the Yanks start, like, 
four and five. They are going to be going after it in New York. You know, one other thing, Scott. One other thing I should mention here: if you trade Torres by opening day, you've got room for both. And honestly, as good a player as Glaber is, I kind of think the Yankees need to do that and play both these kids up the middle. It's a risk, but you also have DJ. You can also do some other things too. They need an injection of this kind of youthful energy. And granted, they'll get it either way. But even though it's a risk to play two guys like that fairly regularly, I don't know. They're both quite highly thought of. And you trade Torres for maybe some pitching. And that would kind of be the thing to do. But it gets back to Scott, what you were saying earlier. Those trades are tough to make. They've tried to trade Torres and haven't been able to do it. But that is the obvious answer to this. Now, the Yankees and their fans are probably thinking, well, we'd rather trade Josh Donaldson. Yeah, I know that you'd rather trade Josh Donaldson, but he doesn't <laughs> have the value that Torres does right now. And Donaldson's a terrific defender. I think he's going to bounce back a little bit, too. And, and Yanks fans were hard on him last year. That's the only thing that stands out to me, though, is do you, do you think there's a legitimate shot based on conversations that Glaber Torres could be dealt either around this time or, or at some point this season? by the Yanks to make room for that youth movement, that's definitely newsworthy for Yankee fans and, and probably mixed reactions from them. It is definitely a possibility. It's something, Scott, that they've been trying to do. They had that deal with the Marlins at last year's deadline. It was Torres, somebody else for Pablo Lopez. It just They couldn't line it up, but it's something that's been discussed before. It's not that newsworthy, actually. So I can see them entertaining that, trying to do that. But it's also going to depend on how these guys perform. Peraza has not had a good spring. What you put into that, how much you weigh that into this, I don't know. Maybe they just believe Peraza is the guy. He's the better natural shortstop than Volpe. And ultimately, that's the way they want to go. And if that's the case, that's fine. And fans are not front office people in terms of evaluation. We, we don't, even media, we don't see things the way they do. Now, they're not always right. But guess what? Fans aren't always right. Media members aren't always right either. No, it's a good little mix. Hey, Ken, enjoy the time at home. I'm sure you'll be hitting the road again soon. We'll talk to you next week for opening week of the season. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Good stuff. We'll bring on Ross Stripling in a moment here on FT Live as well. That was interesting there at the end. I didn't really think about it. We've heard about it for years. Trade rumors here and there that have involved Glaber. He's also been a solid player. I mean, he's had his ups and downs as a Yank. He clearly was out of position at times, too, for the Bronx Bombers, phrase. So be interesting yeah. if they make a move. I mean, if they make a move and, and grab a pitcher, I don't think Yankee fans would necessarily hate it. That's the thing. I mean, if, if we said this a few years ago, he was supposed to be one of the future superstars. He hasn't been a superstar. He's been, he's been solid. Yeah, and it's, it's New York. Sometimes it takes a little bit out of you, a little bit. Some people can handle it. He, he's held his own, but he's also had his, his lulls, too, as well. So... For him, maybe to go somewhere else and take off, I mean, you've seen it done before. So um, to get another pitcher, I, I don't think the Yankees will be that upset, or the fans, I should say. Um, but it is very interesting to think about. I, I would like to see the upbringing of these young kids get in there. You know, it's kind of like we, they picked up Didi Gregorius. Put him in the fire. Derek Jeter's gone. Didi, let's go. See what you got. You know, he struggled in the beginning, and then all of a sudden he took off. So you got to let these young guys play here a little bit and let them, uh, you know, go through their trials and tribulations. Put, hey, I mean, our next guest is Ross Stripling, right? He hasn't he hasn't locked in his apartment in in, <laughs> in San Fran yet. We'll have to ask him. They need a second <laughs> baseman. Well, we'll ask Ross if he wants to uh, go to the stop to the Big Crabsy. Apple. Stop. All right, we're bringing him in then. Chicken strip. Ross Stripling joining us right now, uh, wearing San Francisco Giants proud on his sweatshirt. Yeah, yeah there you go. Show Kratzy. Did you get your apartment yet? <laughs> Tell him. You got a home now. Yeah, we got a house, man. Yeah, we're. I got two kids. I got a. Uh, that was the first thing we did, man. Set them up. So we're in good shape. Yeah, but I mean, I know it's not in San Fran. You're only making $25 million in the next two years. You can't live in the city of San Francisco. So you're like, you're commuting. Like, are you even in California? just barely yeah right on the border uh it's gonna right. to, i'm gonna have to train i'm gonna have to train in and then uh you know no we're, we're good man we're close it's gonna be fun 
<laughs> good, good. Kratzy, did you guys play together? And, and Shrimp, and said, right, usually I ask him beforehand, but no, exactly. You would think that you guys played together for 10 years. He's all over you already, Strip. You can give him shit back. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, no, I mean, we played in some playoff games against each other, man. I feel like I remember Kratzy well. Uh, always heard good things about him. And then when we, you got, you know, for one, congrats on the show, guys. Um, definitely Thank looking you. forward to coming on a bunch. Uh, talked to Kratz on the phone and we just hit it off immediately. And he was like, you want to come on? And I was like, yeah, have me as much as you guys want. So I uh, can tell this is going to be a good time. No doubt. No doubt. And you, I mean, the new baby, like, we're going to get right into it here. Like the new baby still got the new car smell. Two weeks old? <laughs> two weeks old, man. Just wow. over two weeks old. Yeah, it's wow. it's. It's been a crazy spring. It's made it go by so much faster, honestly, because I, I, I pitched a Sunday. I flew home that night. We had a baby Monday morning, and then I got that whole turn at home, came back, and then pitched the next day. So I, I got that week off, but it was like right in the middle of spring. So um, it, made, it made spring training go by so fast, man. I can't, we're, we're flying out here tomorrow. I mean, it, it just blows my mind. Did you catch did – you, did you play any catch on, you know, during the time that you were home? Like were you <laughs> out of the hospital? Because I know some guys do it differently. I uh, – the first couple of days, no. Uh, I, I was walking around like the hospital uh, parking garage looking for like a place to throw some plyo balls uh, <laughs> to no avail. And, um, you know, luckily everything went great with the birth. His name is Brody. And after two days, we were able to take him home. So I got another – like two and a half days at home where I was able to get some stuff done and actually went down to rice and threw a bullpen there. So I was able to get some work in. It wasn't great. Uh, it was probably the worst bullpen I threw in my life and I'm not even sure I was awake for it, but, um, you know, came back and, and was able to actually pitch five innings and stay healthy, which is all you can ask for after something like that. So, um, you know, feeling good and family's doing good back home. Looking forward to getting them out in the Bay when, uh, when I get out there. Hey Ross, how does it feel to be reunited with uh, your best friend, uh, Alec Wood, man? That's uh, Alex Wood. How does that feel? <laughs> Alec. Uh, it feels great, man. It really does. You know, Alex um, just hit it off with him immediately in L.A. Uh, he was in my wedding, like one of my best friends for sure. And then Jock was my double A roommate. Uh, Kapler was my minor league coordinator and Farhan was an assistant GM in my time in L.A. So a lot of familiar faces. Uh, so that's good. Coming into the locker room, we're used to it, right? You're used to moving up levels or getting traded or, or whatever it is. We're used to making new friends on a whim and, and joining new teams. But it's, it's good to have some familiar faces in there that uh, make you feel more comfortable. And Alex specifically on the pitching side. Uh, pick his brain about you know what we do over here who I can go to for certain things you know which which PT he likes the most you know all that kind of stuff that we uh that we start asking each other and uh it's 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 been great man it's um honestly it feels like a family reunion in a way now you're saying we and you're wearing the Giants you know you're kind of you're kind of in enemy territory after you know your hiatus to to the big north but you know being an LA Dodgers you know, now you're with the Giants. Are you are you guys taking it? Are you guys taking it personally that nobody's picking you guys to win the West or even come in third, second place in the West? You know, um, like a little bit, right? I, I feel like, but also there's kind of a chip on the shoulder of being the underdog and being the guy that uh, you know way more star power in LA in San Diego. But we're like a sneaky veteran team. Like our whole. Pitching staff is essentially in free agency besides Webb, who's our best guy, uh, starting opening day for us. And, you know, we go out and get Hanniger and Conforto and to come in with Crawford and Jock. Like, we have a sneaky veteran team, like guys that have been around, played in big games, won rings, and know how to play the game at a high level and, and play in the big leagues, right? So we're, we're kind of like a, a sleeping giant in a way. Well, that's pun oh. pun not intended, but I'll walk right into it. Um you know, so I, I feel like we kind of like the position that we're in, where everyone's talking about the Dodgers, everyone's talking about the Padres, rightfully so, but we're right there. We're, we're two years away, two years removed from winning 107 games and, um, you know, have a lot of trust in, in Farhan and what he does and how he puts lineups out on the field and, and how he gets a competitive advantage doing the way, um, you know, kind of platooning and, and doing what he does. And, and um, man, it just it, we're confident and we feel like we're ready to rock and you can tell season right around the corner and we're, we're ready to get it going. Who do you think right now is going to have the career year? I mean, you mentioned a lot of guys that are like, whoa, like, you know, Mitch Hanniger. I love Mitch Hanniger. You know, is he going to yeah. come back? Conforto. I mean, that dude is just banging sinkers over the seats and left. Like, <laughs> who is a guy that you're like, whoa, we got this guy for X amount? Holy crap. Like, steal. Yeah. You know who it is so far for me is Manaya. 
And I know he's coming off probably a, a frustrating year for him, but he, he kind of reinvented some stuff this offseason at driveline, which, uh, you know, people hear all the time. They go to driveline. They learn some new stuff. They get on some plyo balls. They learn how their body moves, get with the biomechanics things. And, and man, he, he looks great. He's throwing hard. His stuff looks good. I play catch with him. It hits it hard, as hard at 200 feet as it does at 60 feet. I mean, he's, like, got that real just, like, a heavy ball, you know. Um and he's just looked really good. And and honestly, if we're all healthy, which we are at the moment, we have seven big league starters. So it'll be interesting to see how we get used. And you can never have too much pitching. But, you know, to answer your question, Shamanaya feels like a steal right now because he just, you know, really he's been great his whole career besides for a little scuffle last year. And if we can get him just back to his normal self, that's such a huge weapon for us because um, – I don't know if he'll throw 180 innings or if he'll throw out of the bullpen or a mixture of both or what, but he's he's just a huge weapon that we're going to have at any time, which is awesome. Hey, Ross, on that on that um, question, what you were saying, I'm trying to piggyback a little bit. Do you like starting pitching better or, or do you, you like coming <laughs> into relief like the swing man? Uh, uh, what, what do you like there? Yeah, you know what, man? There's, there's no better gig in the world than being a starting pitcher in the big leagues. I can promise you that, uh, you know, Throwing a hundred pitches and getting five days off—that's uh, that's that's a pretty nice job. I'll sign up for that all day. I think my arsenal fits better as a starter. You know, I'm a guy that throws five, six pitches, anything, anytime. Uh, I feel like you know, third time through the order, guys should still not have any idea what's coming as much as they did the first at bat. But I will say, pitching out of the bullpen is a ton of fun. It really is. Uh, as far as like the phone ringing, a shot of adrenaline, you're up and you're like getting hot and you're coming in in a big situation. Uh, you're also part of like a group of like eight or nine guys down there that have a lot of pride. In, the, in themselves and, and what they do for the team. And they don't get a lot – they're like the offensive line, right? They don't get a lot of love. Uh, so there's like some bitterness and some saltiness down there. It's just uh, being in the bullpen is is maybe more fun, to be honest. But uh, I'll take the starting gig in the big leagues all day. Hey, Russ, you've always had one of the best attitudes about that. And it's made you super valuable <laughs> as a player. What do you tell a player that's like, I only want to start? I'm not going to name names, but there are definitely guys that have been both publicly vocal or guys that I've just been around in a clubhouse that are like, I'm pissed. I don't know what my role is, or I just want to be a starter. I remember even years back, I think you you gave a great line at one point where you were like, I can be the Kike Hernandez of the Dodgers. You can put me anywhere in a pitching yeah. situation. That's the attitude a team wants to hear, and you're genuine about it. So what do you think about guys that get stubborn about wanting to be a starter, and what would you tell them? Yeah, and I've, I've told many guys before because I've kind of gotten, you know, even how you're just talking about, kind of gotten the reputation as being the guy that does it and has done it and, and has had success doing it. So I've had a lot of people pick my brain about how to get it done. And, and really two things. The first one I say is go make 25 starts in AAA then if you want. You know, this that's how you're going to stay in the big leagues, man. It's a valuable role. And every team wants someone that does it well, someone that can bridge a short start to the back in the bullpen, can get a three inning save, can save innings for for other pitchers. That's an extremely valuable role. And when I was young, I knew it's what kept me in the big leagues. So that was my mentality. And the other one you kind of touched on, take your ego out of it, man. Like, who are you? I, I don't care if you were a first rounder. I don't care if, if Baseball America says you should make 30 starts for Team XYZ this year you're in the big leagues and you got 25 other guys around you that are counting on you to, to get outs when they hand you the ball. And I think you got to take your ego out of it and understand that this is an extremely valuable role. I am in the big leagues, helping a team, helping a team win games. And the alternate is me in Oklahoma city or Louisville or Charlotte or whatever, throwing 150 innings on a bus. And, and, you know, it, it just is, it's always been a no brainer for me. So when guys are struggling with that, I just I try to take your ego out of it and understand that what you're doing is extremely valuable and we're we need you in that role. And, and there's a reason you're in that role. So it's, it, I get kind of fired up, as you can tell, talking about it, because it, it does make me mad when guys are frustrated in that role. Uh, we have we have like a social media team that's cutting this live. I hope <laughs> they cut all of that up and they just <laughs> blast it out there because that is such an awesome, awesome mentality. Hit, hit me with like. How did you come up with that? Because even your buddy Alex Wood, the dude was a first rounder. He has been, I mean, he's never in the minor leagues. Like you, you took yeah. till you were 26 when you were in the big leagues. Did that shape it? Or being around a guy like Alex Wood, who's, you know, he's just automatically going to be in the big leagues, but he's doing bullpen, he's doing starting, or was this like a Dodgers thing? You know, what, what shapes that? Because that's important. Yeah, it's, well, I'm in my eighth year in the big leagues, right? So uh, uh, I've got my answer down now because I guess asked that question a lot for sure. Um, you know, what shaped it really was 
was I started in the big leagues as a starter. I, I did fine, but not great. I got optioned all the way from the big leagues to Arizona, to the AZL, to basically revamp stuff. They wanted me to start throwing up in the zone. They wanted me to start uh, tunneling my curveball with fastballs up in the strike zone and, and stuff that I just wasn't comfortable doing. But I bought into it. Another kind of thing that what we're talking about, you got to buy into it. These guys know what they're talking about. They knew that if I was going to have success in the big leagues, that's what I needed to do. So I did it. And I make my way back to the big leagues, but not as a starter. And I was doing the up and down thing and could tell that if I was going to stay in the big leagues, I mean, we're talking about early Dodger years, man. You got like Kershaw and Rich Hill and Kinsa Maeda, uh, Brandon McCarthy, Brett Anderson, Hunjin Rue. Like there, there was nowhere in the, in the rotation for me. So if I was going to pitch innings in the big leagues, it was going to be in that role. I wasn't going to be an eighth inning guy. I threw 90 miles an hour, you know, so I was going to be a guy that was going to get six, seven, eight, nine outs and maybe go through the lineup once and, and finish a game when we were losing or winning by five or more, you know, and I, I just accepted it. And I think it was a product of, yeah, being on a good team with the Dodgers where I knew that was my role. Now, if I was on a team that lost a hundred games and I wasn't getting an opportunity, maybe a little ego comes into play. Maybe I'm saying, why am I not getting an opportunity opportunity? But I think to answer your question, it, it was just a product of being on the Dodger team that was great and had World Series expectations. And if I was going to help them win, it was going to be in that role. And I just accepted it and ran with it. Hey, Ross, um, I'm always looking for the next best uh, financial advice. Are you still doing <laughs> any advisor stuff in the offseason? Because uh, I'm looking for a little four to six percent here somewhere so I can, you know, keep building on my money. What do you got? Are you still doing that at all or no? Yes. Yeah, definitely, man. Hey, you can get four to six percent right now. Uh, you're still going to lose to inflation. But basically, every big bank has uh, uh, their money market account paying you four plus percent right now. So, um, you know, safe money there for sure. I am not optimistic about the market over the next year or so. I just think uh, there's not a whole lot we can point to and and feel great about. But yeah, definitely still do it. Um, I'm a licensed money manager and I manage my my money, my family's money, some friends and acquaintances and uh it's been a rough uh, last year and a half or so, but um, mm -hmm. I see light at the end of the tunnel, and you just got to hang in there in times like this, man. The, the the research and history shows you if you just can hold tight during times like this, you'll get paid. Uh, you know, the, the stock market is is the best way to create wealth long term, man. So everyone, stick with it. Do you think this is something that needs to be addressed more by Major League Baseball or maybe by the teams for the players? Do you think it's under under addressed? You know what? Um, I would say no, honestly. The the I think when you're in a locker room, for one, these guys are making a decent amount of money, and and you're kind of expected to become financial financially literate when you have that kind of money in your pocket. Guys are you know they might talk about crazy stuff, some altcoins and crypto, some you know wacky penny stocks and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong; they're always trying to to hit the home run. But for the most part, when you have money in your pocket, you're going to be very conscious of where it is, where it's going and why it's going there. And, um, you know, it, it maybe the Latin American guys are behind on stuff like that because they just aren't as exposed to it. And, and who knows if they even have financial guys or if they have someone taking care of their money, um, you know, so I would maybe like to be able to help them out more than than I can or than I do. But, you know, really, for the most part, the guys I see around in the locker room are very aware of, of where their money is and, and why it's there and, and actually very um smart when when like an a, a investment comes across them as far as how to dive into it and maybe um invest into it because you know when you have money opportunities come up and you got to be able to decide one versus the other and why you should do it or why not you know that's good stuff hey the uh league just made a ton of money on the world baseball classic and it was just amazing yeah. for the game ross i want to finish with that your thoughts on the wbc from how it looked the otani trout the knocks for USA sometimes about pitching and how some guys are just being um, kind of overmanaged by their teams. Um, and then you had mostly people loving what they saw and then a few trash takes on Twitter from people probably just trying to get attention or people that maybe don't like baseball. Man, I, I feel like it had to have lived up to every expectations we could have had for it. I mean, I really do. For one, it ended up being a movie script, right, with Otani facing Trout with the whole tournament on the line. I mean, you couldn't have chalked it up any better than that. Um, I mean, you heard stats like 97% of all of Japanese TVs were tuned in to that at bat. You know, so, I mean, it was obviously a hit. It really was. You could tell that the players loved it. Every interview they gave at the end of it was like, this is the most fun I've had playing baseball in X amount of time, maybe ever. Um, you know, get to wear the country across my chest, how much that means for everyone that talked about it with the energy that those guys were playing with the dude for, um, 
think it was from Venezuela, the lefty that had like his whole shirt unbuttoned and he gets an out <laughs> to win a game and he's just like going crazy on the field. I mean, you could just tell what it meant to those guys. So I think that's awesome. Um, I mean, you hate to see injuries. Don't get me wrong between Diaz and Altuve. That, that's, that's, I hate that, but you know, that is part of the game. And, um, gosh, what's the other thing you asked about? I don't know. Any, any hot take. I, I think they're just wrong. That was, that was like fun. Baseball played the right way on a massive stage and it, and it all came together as well as we could have hoped at a time when all of us are not necessarily at our best, at our most ready, and we still put an awesome product on the field for the entire world. I mean, I just – I think anyone that didn't enjoy that, you just don't like baseball. I don't know. Then, then Major League Baseball is not for you either because that was that was a ton of fun and arguably the way baseball should look and be played, and uh, I thought it was just great. Simply put, I mean, there were so many are you not entertained kind of memes and, and gifs out there too. Like, what's not to like? I'm sorry. I mean, you know, you've played a lot of spring training ball. Do you want to watch a, a spring training game over <laughs> Otani versus Trout in the WBC when they care more, you know, they, they care way more about that than how spring training's going. So I'm with you, Ross. That was awesome. Hey, great to have you on. Like you mentioned, we're pumped to have you on throughout the season. Um, and I know Pierzynski, who's off today, but he'll be back on, is ready to get after it with you too. So Good luck for opening day and all that, and we'll talk to you in a few weeks, all right? Yeah, guys. Good uh, good luck with the show. Look forward to getting on soon. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Awesome. That was Ross Stripling with us on FT Live. Great insight on so many fronts, too. He's so well-spoken, as you can tell. And, and of course, Fraze is trying to get financial advice. Shocker. He's like, yo, give me – he didn't give hey, you a listen. stock tip, though. I thought he was going to give you a stock tip. But here's the, here's the thing. You don't, you don't want to steer somebody in the wrong direction. I felt where he was going with it. I, I felt he was going to, if we got, if we dive more into it, you know, buy now because everything's so low and then it's going to kick back in a year or two. But, um, yeah, man, hey, if, if you ain't working, you ain't trying, big dog. You got to <laughs> keep it going. You know how it is. Eric's sitting back there just chilling now. He, I'm, he's going to learn a little bit from me. I'm going to learn a little bit from him. And now when he understands, hey, take that money, put it in some good, Good investments, and uh, we, you know, we can have a segment on that too. I, I think that would be very heartfelt for everybody too. I would love that. We'll stay. I'll stay in my lane, giving people financial advice, especially <laughs> like I need to listen to your financial advice with that cage you got in the background there. I know that. Hey, didn't, that, that was that was free. You didn't know that. That was <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, my hey, my school wants a second cage. Let's get let's get it done. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Hey, Matt Barnes is going to join us in five minutes. Let's uh, let's do our Friday toast. We made it through another week of FT Live. Whatever you got, it's all good. Could be a dog. <coughs> could be Excuse water me. if you're if you're battling a little illness. That's I, what it's I got a little H H two bro here. Eat clean, bro. Water. H two bro. Let's yes. go. Cheers, cheers to everyone behind the scenes too with us. We appreciate you a ton, and everyone that's watching right now as well. Cheers, your orange juice, your water, adult beverage, whatever you got going on. Lacroix. Very fancy. You're so fancy with your Crouch, you make that can look so small, bro. Your hands, <laughs> you got the biggest hands I've ever seen in my life. It's, 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 yeah. Guys, Is that that's, an a real, that's, a, that's like a can of soda, just so people, if you could see that. That it might be, that might be one of the sneaky traits of baseball players. Huge hands. Like, yeah. sneaky, like when you meet guys, and I've met some football players, basketball players, clearly, but basketball players, they're like, Long. You know, their fingers are like, wow, like yes. a full, like, they're just, they're so long. But baseball players, you get some thick mitts, like right in the, in the palm area. And you go to, you go to, you go to give them a handshake and it's like, it doesn't even go around their hand. Like, it's like, I don't even know how your, your hands move. Like Jordan Mailata from the uh, Eagles, the left tackle or right tackle, I'm not sure what he plays, guard, something like that. His hand is ginormous, but some yeah. baseball players they'll put out some they'll put out some mitts out there. Yeah, there's certain attributes that that contribute. The one that always gets me too that I explain to people is for baseball players, some of the guys with the real compact swings, short arms. Short arms, great hitters. Yeah, it's just not something you'd expect, right? And in basketball, it's it, it's wingspan, so you're going the other way. If you've got great wings, wingspan, that's going to help you. For baseball players, I'm you know one of the keys naturally that you can't do unless there's some weird surgery that I don't know about, short arms. Fraze, you saw it. Yeah, I think of Gene Segura. I mean, that's the one guy that comes up to me just whipping through that zone, no matter where it is. It's, oof. 
Gene Segura, Jose Altuve, back, you know, back a few years now, 10 years, Josh Willingham, like guys with absolute gator arms. Not like Todd. Todd's always getting into that wallet with those long arms. I'm not not afraid of – but, <laughs> you know, it's mechanical stuff. Like, a lot of people talk about, you know, back leg and hip drive, all that stuff. But, like, there's a lot, there's a lot mechanically with your hands and arms. The longer it is, yes, you can get more extension. You can get more of great stuff. But you got a lot that can go wrong, too. Frage, by the way, because we're going to bring in Matt Barnes in a couple minutes – so I don't want to dive into something else right now. Um, just mentally prepare yourself to put that space behind you to use one week from today. And there's even going to be apparently a few others joining me. Like maybe it's not a live studio audience, but there'll be a little bit of, of an audience. I'm bringing a couple people down there from uh, from the sales team that want to say hello. So just just make sure the space is nice and tidy for a potential demo, whatever you want to show us. It's a different version of a demo maybe than people are used to. We're not doing 12 minutes cookie cutter. Like give me give no. me the goods in two minutes. Give me the good stuff, something you want to bring up because it's going to be the regular season at that point. So I just want, want you to get that stirring in your head a little bit. We might ask some we people also. We got it. I got everything set up here. No worries. We uh, The lights will be booming. We got nothing to worry about here, baby. We'll always get it done here. So I need you to be loose too. Because uh, we're Luke, putting you to work. Luke, Stretching Luke. out? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. good. I got, I, I'll have everything ready. You know, my wife has all the setup of the workout stations down there. We'll get it loose. I'll have that. What's that thing you put around your waist and it just shakes your back and forth? <laughs> I'll find one of those and uh, get the hips loose in the back and the jelly rolls back there going. So we'll be all right. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? And you just sit there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that might be our first demo. Hey, on oh. that note. Let's bring in Miami Marlins pitcher Matt Barnes, the veteran, joining us right now. Northeast guy moving down to Miami, Florida. Excited to get into it. How you doing, man? You liking uh, the warm weather at this time of year? Because I moved down here recently, and I got to say, it's glorious. Yeah, I mean, we have, we've always been down here, right, this time of year. But I tell you what, when in about, what's it, three days now when we head down to Miami instead of back up north, um, it's going to be nice to be playing in some – climate controlled territories and not having to wear 14 layers to stay warm. Although in fairness, I think we're only putting it off a week though, because our first trip is to New York and Philly. So um, we'll get our fair share of it. Yeah, no doubt. I'm sure you're, you're, you're not, nobody's, nobody's looking forward to be anywhere North in April or even like mid May. Like you can get a nice cold night in, in Boston, which let's, let's dive right into it, bro. Like, were you pissed when you got, when you got traded from Boston, like, let's just be flat honest. Yeah. Um, initially, yeah. I mean, I was just kind of confused about it, truthfully, um, right off the bat. But, like, the more that I sit back and look at it, I mean, it's kind of the nature of the business, right? Um, and, and, and I've tried to look at it on, on kind of the positive side of it, right? Like, how much, you know, as long as – or as, as much as I would have loved to spend my entire career there, how many people can say they played – 12 years with one organization, right? I mean, it was the only one that I ever played for. So, um, well, yeah, did it suck when it happened? Of course. But um, listen, I saw 12 great years, and that organization, like, truly gave me everything that I had up to this point in the game. So, um, you know, it is what it is, and, and we're kind of moving forward now. Hey, Matty, I, I feel you a little bit because when I played for Cincinnati for almost six years, um, I remember hearing the rumors – the speculations. I remember I, I got the call and I thought everything was, you know, I, t I, t I got the call, hey, you're getting traded to the White Sox. I'm like, I kind of teared up a little bit if you want the truth. You know, you've been with an organization for so long. You know, yeah, you know the security guards, you know the, the fans, you know where everybody sits. I call my wife, she's crying left and right. It, it's a whirlwind, bro. Your first time you ever traded, it, it's something that kind of hits you a little different. Yeah, without a doubt, right? Like, and, and I think you hit it you, right. You hit it right in the head. It's like you know everybody, right? The third base coach was my first manager when I got into pro ball. The hitting coach I played with in college, he was my teammate. Um, the bullpen coach is my high A pitching coach. I mean, you want to go on and on. Trainers I had in double A, triple A, high A. Like, I just and I had relationships with all of them, right? You pull into the parking lot, you know those guys. So it's just. It's just different, right? You kind of have to go through and you relearn everybody. You go through that whole process. And for me, the, the hardest part is just the routine, right? It was, 
okay, well, I had this. And like little things that a lot of people don't think about is like in the whatever parts of nine years that I had in the big leagues with Boston, right? Like I had two trainers and I would just, for the last five years or four years, I had the same guy every day. So I would just go in, hop on the table and we would just get to work, right? So adjusting to a new training staff where they're like, well, what do you want to get done? And like, what do you like? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just, I've always just hopped to the table and we just went. So like yeah. <clears throat> there's aspects to it that just take some time to get used to in terms of the routine and what you do and learning the guys and the staff and, and everything like that. Do you say, Hey, call my guy in Boston. I'm going to give you his number so you can do the same thing. It's like me. I mean, same on a very different note, but it's like, I go down to Florida. If you're seeing a doctor and they're like, Hey, you know, cause what's wrong with your head? I, I, I had a head issue and they're it's like, Oh, call my other doctor about the referral. Do you do some, something like that to make sure it's seamless? Sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I texted Brandon with the socks and I was like, listen, can you just give me like a, like a write up of what we did so I can just hand it to these guys and be like, so this is what I've done for the last five years. Um, yeah. And he, and he put that together for me. So it definitely made the transition easier and smoother. Um, and of course, just over time, right. You know, you kind of figure out who you want to work with and you, kind of who you like the best. And then from there, you start building the rapport with them. Um, and we're in a good spot now with, with kind of all of that. So, um, but it's crazy, man. I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of have to figure out and deal with. Um, I mean, I had a house in Fort Myers that, you know, I would always go down there in January and go work out at JetBlue and obviously not doing that anymore. So my wife and I were like, okay, well, we're going to sell the house. So now it's, figuring out where are we going to rent a place in spring training, find a place in Miami. It's, you know, when we were down there for the fan fest, I spent an afternoon going all over Miami looking at places because I just don't know the city. Um, and, and then, you know, once the house gets listed and all that, it's moving all the stuff out of the house, all the clothes. So it just, there's a lot of stuff that you have to take care of. Um, it's not just going to a new team and, and anybody who's been traded understands all of that, right? It's just, there's a lot of outside stuff that you got to take care of um, that isn't just the baseball stuff. Yeah, the, the rigors of non-baseball stuff. Right. My wife always used to pack up my stuff. She used to want, she just wanted to wring my head. But other than that, let's let's go back a little bit. You went to UConn. Um, yep. They're having a great, great Oops. time right now. They're doing awesome in basketball. Um, you got them winning in your bracket for one. That's my first question. And then my – in both my brackets, I got UConn winning it all. All uh, right, yeah, I hey, I like him, man. They look real. Hey, Hurley over there, he's a Jersey guy. I know the family real well. He's absolutely out of his bird. That's why I love him so much. He'll tell the <laughs> referees what he really feels about him. I don't know if you ever met the guy before, but he's outstanding. Great family. So um, I've never like, physically met him, but um, like through social media and like going to the games and whatnot, him and I have connected. And I text him after every game, and he answers, and I'm like. Hell yeah, man. Keep it going. Like this is, it's a lot of fun, man. It's a yeah. lot of fun. And I think no they, they just, to me, they've been the most dominant team in the tournament by far. So, Yo, I, I, I agree. I agree. Just from an overall standpoint, defense and offense, they're dominating the heck out of the whole thing. And his dad, not to go any further, but his dad was probably the best high school coach ever in New Jersey. Really? Um, yeah. Down there at St. Anthony's, uh, they, they dominated just year in and year out. But let's go to baseball, too. I mean, the facilities at UConn have gotten yeah. 10 times better. Uh, Jim Penders, who I actually played against when I was there at Rutgers, okay. um, what a great, outstanding coach there, man. They have the goods there. I mean, I remember seeing that video this year of what they upgraded, man. Talk about, talk about that for a second. They, if, you're, if you want to go to a place in the Northeast besides Rutgers, of course, let me get that in there. I think UConn will be the next best bet for sure. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. In my, my junior year – uh, I mean, obviously, I had a really good year my junior year. Rutgers, my kryptonite. <laughs> and I don't know why, man. I don't know. It just – it was something about them. And I think it's yeah. super ironic because my wife ended up going to PT school at Rutgers because she's a Jersey girl. So, it – but – um move. I know. But the facility, I mean, I, they're, they're incredible, right? I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to – I went back, was it last year maybe or – might have been the end of the season last year, and I went back and kind of walked around and saw all of it and, and what they've put together with not only the baseball stadium but the facility next to it with the weight room and everything, um, the cages. It, it's just – it's really incredible. And I think that they needed something like that, right? Like 
they were getting the talent and they were a good quality program and have been for probably the last like 10 years now, right? 10, 15 years. Um, but it's so hard to compete with these other massive schools, right? And there is a lot of talent in the Northeast from a baseball perspective. It's just in order to attract the elite level talent that is there, you need to have the facilities, right? And unfortunately, up until this was done, you just they didn't have that to pull somebody away from, I don't know, North Carolina or Virginia and LSU or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So, yes. um, I think just from a recruiting standpoint, it just it makes such a difference that you can like have the facilities to be proud of and like walk kids around with potential recruits and be like, look what we have now to offer you guys makes such a drastic difference. And, and fun fact, Frage, I called some of Matt's games in the Cape League when he was spending summers there on, on Wareham. Springer was on the team at least one of the seasons, if not two, and, and was ridiculous. I had like Kevin Vance, Joe Pavone, uh, a few of these other guys that you probably know, absolute characters on UConn. So and we've, we've talked about it before. What I want to ask you about then is, all right, so you, you did the Cape scene, you did the Northeast. We talked about this, Boston for a long time. Now you're in Miami. Yep. First off, how do I put this nicely? Will you miss the Boston media or is it going to be nice to be part of the Miami vibe and scene, which you know is different. Let's do a comp. I'm sure you can see it right away in spring training. After a game, you look around and you're like, that's it's it. Like, All right, cool. Yeah. I'm going home. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, it's honestly, it's kind of like a breath of fresh air and nothing against the Boston media. It's just they're, they're, they're so passionate and into everything and in the know on everything that like nothing slips by. Right. Um, you're getting asked questions after every game and, and, you know, it, it takes some time to like truly get comfortable with all of them um, and kind of like build that rapport with them to where, you know, you can talk to them or say no thanks or whatever. Um, Miami is just, it's, it's just not as prevalent, honestly. Um, and, and, it, and it's kind of nice. You just, you, all you have to do is worry about going to play baseball, right? Like you don't have to worry about all the other stuff that kind of comes around it. Now you were now you were saying like you're 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 really building up the UConn baseball program, but you started out by saying, "Man, I'm so thankful I don't got to go up and put ten layers on." Them boys have been playing for two months; they're outside getting run around. So how do you how do you sell it as an alum? As like like if Matt Barnes comes to my son's house and is like, "Bro, Braden, Ethan, we want you to come to UConn because they're they're on the come up," and they're like, "Okay." But I just heard you say on FT Live that it's freezing in Boston. Yeah, I mean, half, half, the, half the stadiums in the country are in the north, right? If you want to play in the big leagues, guess what? You're going to play in cold weather. Tough. Right? If you want to play in the postseason, you're going to play in cold weather. Tough. You don't like it playing, in, you don't like it playing indoor sport. Plain and simple, right? I mean, it, it, for me, like, and I grew up, growing up in the northeast, I'm not used to playing in cold weather, Right. Does it, does it suck sometimes? Yeah, of course it does. But guess what? As a pitcher, I'm the warmest one on the field, without a doubt. I can guarantee you the guy coming off the bench who hasn't hasn't done anything for half an inning, right? And he's just sitting there. He's cold. He's not really moving around. So, like, you got to take it in as a pitcher. You got to flip it and look at it. And I'm like, guys don't want to hit 95, 6, 7, whatever it is, right, when it's 25 degrees at. You get one off the hands, that's going to hurt, right? So, um I don't know, man. We got heaters and you got jackets and stuff. If, if you can't handle playing in the cold, yeah. It's Love probably that. not. Love that. Talk. Cut cut that up, Twitter. Our, yes. our social media guys got more to cut. Right? <laughs> you got to do hey, it. Hey, Matt, real quick from me. I heard you're a big sneakerhead, man. Are you are you a big fan of, like, Jordan shoes? Or are, 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 is there, like, certain kind of sneakers that you just, you know, have to get whenever you see them come out? Uh, yeah, I'm a big sneaker guy. I'm a big Jordan guy. I, uh, a couple years ago, I, I like built my closet and I, I don't know, I've got probably 70 or 80 pairs of Jordans in there. Um, the one is definitely my favorite, but I'm like, there's a couple that I want to have and want to get, but they're so hard to get on the drop and I'm just not going to spend the money on the, the retail market or the resale market. Yeah, um, let me let me ask you this. I had a pair on today. I want you to see if these are if you have these in your arsenal here. Um, yeah, the platinum elevens. Yes. Oh, the elevens are my all-time favorite. Really? Concords, Space Jams, like all these. 
I got about eight or eight, eight or ten pair of these all in different colors, man. What do you think? These are pretty good to come out to, no? I like, yeah, yep. I like the 11s. I'm a big one guy. For me, the ones are just – it's such a universal shoe that you can wear with jeans or sweats or shorts or whatever. Um, and to me, the one is the most comfortable shoe. Yeah. The most comfortable, Jordan. So – but I've got the 11s. I've got the, the Concords. I've got the regular 11s. I've got the black and red ones. Yeah, I'm gonna, I don't know. I was fortunate What's enough. To play, I played with DP for with Price for I don't know how, yeah. how many years. I mean, the Jordan guy, he wore 13. So it, like once or twice a month, he would just come put a box of Jordans in the middle of the clubhouse and was like, "Here you go." I'm like, "All right, oh, perfect." Yeah. Put some cleats on them too and get out there. Why not? Yeah, so I, <laughs> just start grabbing them, and I'd be like. Appreciate it. Thanks. And I'd get like 10 or 12 pairs a month. That's awesome. That is awesome. Also, Fraser, he nailed it. Like as soon as you brought it up, I don't even know if the, the shoe hit the full screen. That was the speaker hit the full screen. He's like, 11s, let's go. And that's <laughs> unbelievable. That's good analysis right there. You can't like say that you're a sneaker guy and not know what a platinum 11 is. Like you just have to. Perfect. You know exactly. what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh, no, those look kind of familiar. You yeah. called me on it. <laughs> Love no, that. he nailed it. Hey, one more from me before we let you go. So a fan question from Pepper and Sports um, said, your Instagram says, quote, slightly above average gamer. So the question is, what, what games are you playing and how's yep. that going? Because I, I think the one thing that I want to make sure I hammer home with people is sometimes when I talk to fans, they're like, oh, baseball players, they party, they go out a lot, whatever. I'm like, yeah, they used to. Most of them really don't anymore. They're a little more boring on that front. They're fun to talk to, but they're not going out till four in the morning. They are playing video games all night, especially on the road. Fact yeah. or fiction? Uh, fact. I, mean, I, I literally have a laptop that I travel with a whole separate setup with Ethernets and everything. And as soon as I get to the hotel on the road, it's plugged in and we're good to go. <clears throat> but I'm, uh, what am I playing? I'm playing the new Call of Duty right now. So, but I've gone, I'm a big like first person, third person shooter. But I started with Halo back in the day. Um, from Halo to Call of Duty, played some Gears of War. I um, was on the Fortnite kick for a while. And then when Warzone came out, I've been kind of on that for a while. Who's the best? Who's the best that you play against? And you can say yourself, but if you're if you're going up against somebody, who is it? Um, I haven't played with any of the guys here on the team. Um, a lot of the guys in the Sox played Fortnite, and a couple guys played some Call of Duty. But typically when I play Call of Duty now, I play with, ironically, a couple of years ago, one of my best friends from school who I played ball with, his wife's cousin is the kid that I play with all the time now. <clears throat> he goes to Villanova, he's, and this kid is absolutely nails. This kid's he's incredible. So, I mean, I think when we were playing, I don't know what it is in this war zone, but the old war zone in Verdansk, um, we only had like three and a half KD, which is absurd. That's so, crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's he's that guy. So, <laughs> I, always, I always just text him and I'm like, all right, let's hop on. And I won't play with, and my brother plays, me and my brother play, and some of my other boys from school will all play together. Um, but it's fun. I'm all right. I mean, I'm, I can hold my own. I'm, this is the best way to put it. I'm not the guy who can take like a team of four and just go run through a lobby, but I'm a really, really good like second or third player if we have the guy. You know what I mean? Yep. So awesome. understand the way the game works. I'm just I don't know. There's people who are just so good that you know. Hey Matt, drop the mic here. Last thing, tell Eric right now that the snapback is coming back because they. They've been bashing me about wearing snapback hats here, and I, I think you look phenomenal. I got to wear the the fitted one here just for today, but I'm bringing it back just like you are. I did it. I don't. Need, did they ever leave? I, 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 that's what I'm confused about. I didn't think it ever left. I don't know. I the only fitted hat I wear is on a baseball field. Thank you. Thank I don't you. think AJ you, and, and Eric, know, please listen to the man. It. Yeah, I don't know that I. The only fitted hat that I think I own that isn't a baseball hat is a New York Giants hat. Other than that. They're all snapback or whatever this is. Yeah, no, it's that, we call that snapback. It's all no, yeah, no, enough, right. I mean, this is this is this is the issue we got here, Matt. Like, he, he's a third baseman. They don't understand communication. Like, I didn't say the snapback wasn't in. I said bald guys can't be rocking no slapback. Like, why? It just because it just looks like my eyebrows are trying to touch my neck. 
And if you see more, like, like you get to snap, like how you're, like the whole show, you've been like mixing your hat like this. You had it up like that. The hairline's always in, and it's like it's fresh. It's so nice. But for well, a bald guy, I can't be getting no snapbacks. Yeah, see, that's fresh. Like you, you got the beard tight. Bald guys, they, they're, they're, they're like you got to cover it all up. You got to cover it all up. So maybe you should get the beard. Maybe the beard will help you transition. Yeah. I always, I feel like beards. I said it the other day. I feel like beards are for guys that are trying to cover something up about their face, like some guys with like a double <laughs> chin or something. You know? Stop it. You get this one. I don't know that I have that. I don't know. I just had it for a long time, and I just, if I shaved it, I would look like a baby. So maybe that's <laughs> maybe yeah, I, I feel like it, it makes me. I don't know. Oh, it oh, makes him look tough. I like it. It it's looks just, tough. Want a bald guy with a nice ass beard? Like, there's Ooh. something about that. Okay. It makes you look tough. Like a ball. Next time you come back on. With a nice, like, groomed full beard, I'm like, that he's got it. All right. Next time you come on, Maddie, All right. I'll try to grow the beard out. All right. I like it. Uh, that's news to me. That's breaking news. Hey, Matt, great to have you on, man. This was really fun. Enjoyed it. Excited to see what you do uh, with the Marlins this season. Would love to have you back sometime. For sure. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys. It's been fun. Thank you. Appreciate you. Matt Barnes with us. That's that's crazy. Kratzy, are you gonna are you gonna grow that out for us? Sure. And how, how what is the um the thickness level? Like on a one to ten. Like can you grow a a hearty beard? There's some picks. There's some picks back in the day. I started to get some issues with the thickness later on. Like you ever have alopecia? Oh. I was all I was all stressed out about getting sent down and moving all the time. So it like Started like getting splotchy. I haven't grown a beard out in a long time, so maybe we'll. It's a daily show. We'll get. We'll see. We'll see how long it goes. How long is it going to take for you to grow that beard? I mean, way longer than I can tell yours. You just shaved the other day, and you almost have a beard again. Like I get shaved two hours before the show, and it's it no, nice. no. Li listen, this is. Let me let me think. This is like five days old. Like it takes me a while to get it back, man. Yeah. Yeah, no. I forgot. Yeah, yeah you Fra were. Frazier had the baby face the other day. Remember? It was at, what's today's Friday? Everything's. It was Wednesday. Together. Wednesday. He was, he was on here looking young. I did mm -hmm. it on Sunday, and today's Friday. This is a fresh five and a half days old. It takes me about a week to get back to like a one, one and a half on the side. I got to go get them. I got to get checked out tonight. I got to. <laughs> I'm going to a, a gala tonight, man. I got to look fresh. A gala? A gala? What do you call it? Gala or a gala? Gala. I call it gala. No, it's a gala, but I mean. Yeah. I mean, what, you're just what saying he's fancy. What yeah, you want fancy, the details? Huh? Yeah, I got it. it's for a children's specialized hospital, and um, actually, Eat Clean Bro is sponsoring it. So we got there. A, you go. They're uh, sponsoring the food, and uh, all the money's going to children's specialized. So it's nice. a good cause. I've been part of for a long time now, and uh, give them a little praise here. They they help out a lot of kids all over um, New Jersey, and there's a lot more that need help. So the more we can make the better so let's let's do it for the kids and Frage knows they they've got probably 10 20 billboards in jersey where yes. you pass by and if you're in jersey for the first time and you're driving and you see eat clean bro you're like okay i'm in jersey i get yes. it owner, <laughs> uh, owner jamie giovanazzo a good good fresh irish name as you can see but no good italian guy man it's uh it's good stuff, man. Uh, good stuff. Yeah, hey, let's uh, hit a few more things here on FT Live on a Friday. Um, I want to start with a little uh, picture we have that's fresh from the Hall of Fame. Yoshida, who had a great, great World Baseball Classic performance, and I think actually gave Red Sox fans a little bit of an exhale because – that was the guy that was controversial in the offseason. He hasn't even stepped foot on a field yet because they're like, what? This guy, he's not a big dude. You think he's going to hit a ton of homers in Boston? What's the deal? We spent a ton of money on him. And uh, from Ian Brown, who covers the team daily, he said, Masataka Yoshida's bat that he used in the WBC is going to the Hall of Fame, uh, per Tom Karen of Nessun. Yoshida used that bat for a WBC record of 13 ribbies for a championship Japan squad. And uh, Gabrielle Starr added on. How often does a player have something in the baseball hall before they've even made their MLB debut? Can't imagine it's happened many times before. Your thoughts? I think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, the guy tore it up. Uh, it was probably the most watched event, you know, 
worldwide, considering how many people in Japan watched it and how many people in America watched it and all over the world. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a big spectacle. People need to understand. There's been bad views about it, people talking bad about it. This has been an awesome. The WBC was so awesome as a baseball fan watching, you know, if you have, you know, people always talk about, you know, what, what's your, you know, where, where are you from? You know, I'm, I'm half, I'm Scott, for, like for me, I'm Scottish, Irish, I'm German. Uh, I got, you know, people uh, have all different type of ethnicities. If you have like 1% of, you know, Israel, like you're rooting for them. Like if you have 1% of, you know, South Korea, wh whatever, whatever, whatever it is, um, you're rooting for that team because you are part of that. And I think people need to understand that it's, it was such an awesome event. And I hope this kickstarts everything for the next three, four years when the next time it comes up. Boston's Boston's definitely having a little bit of a exhale, seeing the fact that their guy can drive some runs in and can bang the ball out of the park. But the hall of fame is something that I think is, has to be on a must-do to-do list for your lifetime. If you like baseball, even if you don't, just if you like history in America, like the fabric of America history, America's history is through baseball. And I think it is such a great historic museum to go to. I'd been to it probably two or three times on before 2011, and we had an off day playing up in up in you know the northeast there i was playing for the lehigh valley iron pigs and our manager was ryan sandberg so i'd gone to the hall of fame two or three times before this and then you get to go to the hall of fame with a hall of famer you get to see some really really cool stuff in in like the back like catalog stuff that you can't even touch without having white gloves on like getting to hold babe ruth's bat getting oh man like some of the other stuff it was it was awesome to do to be able to experience that with a hall of famer was incredible one more thing i want to do before we get to our next futures division to hit which will be the al west so start thinking about it um this is fresh um taking over twitter right now in mlb never seen this before and, and a lot of people are confused the opening day starting pitching matchups have all been announced. We are almost a full week still away from opening day. And often you, you get teams that, that make the announcement. I think the Yankees said Garrett Cole and some of those kind of teams said it from the jump. But they've all been announced. I, I just I think it's a little it, – it's mostly cool from a marketing standpoint because you know who's pitching. But I'm also wondering, like, if it's got some Vegas vibes to it. I don't know, you know, because you can start setting lines. I just, I know I've never, exactly, exactly. Show me the money, baby, for the uh, podcast crowd. We got a little phrase with the money, the money mic sign. Well, let's go. I, I have not seen that before. That is definitely new to announce all of the pitching matchups a week before things start. I don't hate it. I, I like it. I think it's cool. It gets me fired up and I get to kind of break that down and look at it for a week from both a betting perspective and for us to just kind of slice up because we overplay opening day not from like how fun it is but just it's one game out of 162 but it's it's cool for us to get excited we get real baseball coming up your thoughts on that i, I think it's a yeah. good move you know I'm, I'm not knocking it at all i think it's fun i do i but the only thing that makes me wonder like you know why you don't really have to like is there somebody telling them like hey listen let's get on this a little more so people can you know, maybe look into the future. Are we trying to help out sales? Are we trying to help out TV revenue? What, what are we trying to do? Because, you know, managers, any manager, <coughs> any manager you talk to, excuse me, they don't want to, they don't want to tell their tale at all. They don't want to show their cards, what, what they're doing. I mean, usually back in the day, you know, Clayton Kershaw was starting no matter what, you know, DeGrom was starting for the Mets. But, you know, why would you want to tip, uh, you know, your, your cards here a little bit? I, I don't know. There's something fishy about it. I like it, don't get me wrong, but I'm a little skeptical about why all of a sudden everybody has ha has gotten their rotation in when there's been a lot of injuries uh, and there's you know been a lot of uh, weird things going on. So it's different baseball this year. All good. I like it, but it makes me wonder a little bit. I'm I'm on the same like conspiracy train that you're uh -huh. on there. Like back when gambling was legalized. You know, they did more, you know, they're in, in the different states. They told us, and I was on a team, and I'm not going to say which team in case I'm not supposed to say it, but they told us 
hey, the lineups can't come out to till X time. They used to text us our lineup, you know, who's who's playing the next day, where you're playing, and that way you would, you know, guys that didn't play a lot were getting were getting a little bit of an advance notice. And they said we can't do that anymore, so we have to text you individually, but you can't tell anybody that you're playing. And they said it was based around the betting lines. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a lot of money going the line for this. And I do think there's a marketing play here. Like Rico Baker's in our YouTube chat right now. He said, Bill Shaken from the LA Times said that MLB requested this. I'm not surprised. I, I do I do genuinely think from a marketing standpoint, that's the that's the one thing that sucks with bullpen games. I get it at times, but for marketing purposes, if you know the movie you're about to see, it makes a difference. If you've got names that you can say, this dude's going to be on the mound, it always happens, right? Is there ever a time when you're going to a game and it's a day or two away, especially in our world, and someone doesn't say who's pitching? It's always a part of the conversation. I mean, being someone who lives half the time in New York, you're going to Mets or Yanks, you're like, who's pitching? Is it Cole? Is it Severino? Is it Scherzer? Is it Verlander? Depending on the team we're talking about. So that matters. So I'm all about it. I, I hope we have more of that. So you've got the poster up. Hey, come to the game tonight because we got a big boy pitching. Yeah, but my thing is, all of a sudden, like, gambling-wise, like, if you or me are betting, are they putting this up, like, now? Like, hey, in six, four or five days in advance, and next thing you know, the guy doesn't fit. Like, are they trying to be like, hey, uh-huh. swindle you going one way or another? Like, what is – I don't know. I, well, I shit like happens, Frazier. I mean, you, if one of these guys might, you know, have your classic spring training. Oh, I was bending down for the suitcase, and it came up, and now my back <laughs> hurts, and now I'm not pitching. I mean, that's life. But I, no, I, I actually it. like I announcing it. it. Sometimes I think teams hold back too much. I'm like, announce it. If you have to switch it, you switch it. But at least now you're you're also going to sell more tickets if you say who's starting and yeah. you give it a, give it a no. six day runway. I like that. I got you. I got. I think that you know if you're going opening day, you would know by now. You yeah. know, e- even doesn't matter who's pitching. But yes, I like it. I think it's great. Gets that little get a little more excitement, get the juices flowing a little bit. And uh, all right, hey, I'm going to the ballpark another hour before now, you know, so I want to make sure I'm ready to rock. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. I'm about it. Okay, so let's do some futures bets right now. Let's look at the American League West this afternoon here. We're going to break it down and show you what Vegas is looking at and thinking over-unders. And then our friends at Out of the Park Baseball, which the game is now announced and out there for everyone. I'll show you that at the end. So I believe my voiceover should be out there. I've been talking about it for like a month. But anyway, we're going to look at the AL West projected win totals. So thanks to Vegas Insider for the lines here. They have Houston at 97 and a half. Daring you to go over on Houston if you want it. But that's a high number. Seattle's at 86.5. Texas 81 and a half. The Angels 81 and a half. And Oakland at 59 and a half. And then I'm, I'm saying this all out loud, too, for the podcast crowd, because sometimes people are like, I didn't get to see the full screen or the graphic. Out of the park says Houston way under. They've got them at 90 dubs. They've got Seattle at 87, so pretty much on the money. They've got Texas going over at 84. They've got the Angels at 81, um, which I think in Anaheim would be a massive disappointment. And then they've got Oakland at 68 wins. They've got them way over. And one of my buddies, I'll just start it this way, he's going hard on Oakland with the under. And he texted me about it. He was like, what do you think? I'm going hard on Oakland with the under. And I'm like, Vegas isn't stupid, man. I mean, first off, 59 and a half, they're already booking it for 100 losses, which isn't always a lock. I'm like, you're you're a two-week stretch where they just have a little run with the young guys and it and it ruins things and they win, and they lose 100, 101, whatever, and, and you're screwed. So they're not stupid. They've been doing this for years. Pick a lock. Who wants to start? I'll go. Okay. What do you got? Um, and this is the only reason I'm taking this. I'm taking the Angels with the over. Now, the only reason I'm doing this is because they don't have to play Houston as many times. They don't have to play Seattle as many times. I'm going with Houston with the over. I think Noah Syndergaard's going to have a bounce back year. Um, let's talk about – I mean, Shohei Otani going to do what he does. I think, it's, I think it's the Angels' year this year to get in the playoffs, and I think their number is going to be around 85-86. And um, I don't think necessarily they're going to win the division, but I think they're going to be in that second place talk this year. 
Man, I you said Houston with the over, but I knew you meant you meant L.A. with the over, right? No, are, are the Angels? I'm sorry, yeah, I, yeah, I, Angels. Angels, Angels, Angels. Yeah, yeah. yes, Angels, Astros. It kind of flows. Man, like like Texas and Anaheim, like you want them. I, I think for baseball, you want them to be over 500. You want them to be a really good team. I mean, Texas has done so much, and their starting rotation is like. It's like putting a bunch of elephants on a tightrope. Like, man, this is going to be so cool to watch, but ah, I think something bad's going to happen. Like, yeah. they're, they're, it, I, I got to stay away from that. I, I, I think the lock here, because essentially 98 wins is so many wins to go over for Houston, I'm going with the under with Houston. I'm agreeing with out of the park. I think there is – and and I may I may be stupid. I just I feel like a hundred wins. I feel like it's easier to say a hundred losses for somebody is is legitimate, but a hundred wins for a team at the beginning of the season that is so many. So I'm going to take the under, and I don't really even have a good reason for it. I just feel like it is so much because I think they upgraded from a World Series team last year. But you know Lance McCullers being down again. I think they could have, you know, they could have been planning on him being a big contributor, and we don't know how long he's going to be out for. Altuve, Altuve's hurt, and Altuve now, you know, that's eight to ten weeks. They, they got a lineup though. I mean, they, I mean, Abreu. What I'm looking at, maybe 95 wins for them. I mean, it's really going to be a burner of a season for them. But I think that division mm-hmm. is going to be awesome to watch. No Verlander. And he was yeah. insane last year. No, I'm with you. I, I can't touch that because I, I think there's just as good of a chance of Houston winning 100. At 97 and a half, I, I, think, I think that's pretty accurate. And on, on the Angels, here's the thing. I've been dunking on them for years. And it's know. worked out every freaking year. Uh, unlucky that I couldn't bet for years working for the league. Man, I wouldn't be on this show. I'd be... I'd be chilling in in uh, Fraser's Bahamas hotel, where he was a couple weeks ago, sipping my ties, being like, "Yep, under every freaking year for the Angels." I mean, I don't love their bullpen. It's a fragile roster, and I'm ten for ten, so I'm going to keep going on it. I mean, they no. haven't been good since 2014. Anthony Rendon, period. baby, Anthony yeah. Rendon, let's go. Mm. That's all I'm going to say. I was sitting around. I was sitting mm. around last night, and my my 14-year-old son goes, how are the Angels constantly missing the playoffs? And, like, yeah, a bad bullpen, like, come on, there's plenty of teams with bad bullpens. How many teams have possibly, when they sign Rendon, three MVP candidates, the yeah. two best players in the world, and, you know, Rendon is, you know, was coming off 100 RBIs, 300 hitter, like, smashing the ball how does it constantly come up craps like how are we getting how are we how how are we always there with the angels how much time you got kratzy i got all kinds of reasons for you okay they haven't developed well i think they're doing a much better job now with perimination um but it takes time because it was a mess they haven't developed well they haven't put enough into um international scouting they definitely haven't invested well in pitching in general I mean, it's a team that should be a much better pitching ball club on a yearly basis. Defense is usually pretty good. If you look at the way that they've spent in off seasons, they very rarely go after a starting pitcher. Like the guy to lead the top of the rotation, it just doesn't happen. I was like, Cole's going to be it. That's your guy. And I know he wanted to go to the Yanks, but it's not like he was just making a geographical decision. The Angels didn't offer him nearly as much money as the Yankees. Whatever the number was for Cole, I don't remember. I'll find it in a second that he ended up with 325, I think it was. If the Angels go to Garrett Cole and they they throw 350 plus at him, he's starting to think about it. That's what I would have done. I would have put all my freaking chips down and said, hey, we finally need to invest in pitching. I've heard rumors before that Artie Moreno goes, hey, pitchers only go every fifth day, starters. So I'm not going to spend as much on someone like that. I'd rather go Pujols, Josh Hamilton, Anthony Rendon. How's that working out for you? It's a problem. And it's been like that for a long time. You can't win on two players alone. Trout and Otani, 
does not make a playoff ball club. And we've seen that formula play out year after year. Yep. So they did better in the depth department this offseason, but still, it's it's been a mess there, really. H- how do you have the two faces of the sport not playing playoff baseball every year? Social media and fans and the world freaked out for Otani versus Trout because we don't get to see them on a big stage. Right. I'm done. Drop you're right. Mic. Yep, you're done. Boom. Ready for my pick? Go ahead. So I'm going with the Seattle Mariners. Throw it back up there one more time. I've been on the Seattle train for the last few years, and I've gotten burned, what, two years ago? But last year, it finally came through. To me, it's a 90-win ball club. In my mind, 90-win ball club to be safe. Could be more. I love the Teoscar Hernandez move to give the, the team a little more bulk, a little more pop in the lineup. I love their young pitching staff. George Kirby is one of my favorite young starters in the game. Dude knows precisely where every baseball is going that comes out of his hand. There is so much value to that. I like the rotation in general. Luis Castillo's stuff is off the charts. Um, Logan Gilbert, I think, is going to have a huge year. I like his stuff a lot, and he's taking the next step right now in spring training. Bullpen, in my mind, is upper echelon. I mean... Andres Munoz is insane. Paul Seawald, one of the top closers in the game, very underrated him in Munoz. And Seawald's going to join us a lot this year. Um, that's a good-looking team in my mind. Big dumper, Cal Raleigh, really good catcher. I know Kratz can probably appreciate what he does. J.P. Crawford, solid glove. Ty France, one of the best just hit tool guys in the league. Gino Suarez, good for 35-40 dingers. Another underrated acquisition this offseason, Colton Wong. Solid ball player. He's actually picked it up lately um, with the bat. So Jared Kelnick has Eric, not worked he, out he's for them been at waiting. all. He's been waiting for this segment, I think. he's just, No, I'm just running just through the nonstop. roster right now. So he's got Seattle winning it all this year, I'm telling you right now. No, no. This, I'm just no, I'm this telling, is, I'm trying to talk people, and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is because wow. we end up breaking down each division. And, hey, I don't even remember if you were on or not, Fraser. I think you were. I went over on the red. So it's like. I'm just looking at win totals, and I'm telling you what I'm thinking. And I'll put money down on all these, and I'll show the bet slips before the season starts. I'll play some next week. But A.J. Pollock added, Julio Rodriguez in the outfit. I'm just saying, it's a pretty good ball club. It's a team that if, if you told me they surprised the world and win the division, I wouldn't be shocked. No. I just I have a hard time seeing this roster win, say, 85 games or less. So that's my over. That's all. I'm just trying to convince you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this confident when I'm talking about any of my locks because we only get one pick per division. So... That's the one that stood out to me. Anybody tailing that? Anyone want to throw it, throw down with me on that? I mean, the way you talked, I'm 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 putting my mortgage on it now. <laughs> yeah. Right, Eric? I mean, hey, forget about the financial advice. I'm putting all my my pennies and stocks and bonds into the Mariners this year. Watch out. They're they're a sneaky. This is why baseball needs to sell the whole game and not just regional aspects of it. Like you have to know when you have Ty France, an all-star, a Eugenio Suarez. You know, they picked up Colton Wong, all added into, you know, you got 20 homers from Big Dumper behind the dish. And you have Julio Rodriguez, who looks like an MVP candidate for the foreseeable future. I like you gotta sell, you gotta sell these teams. And Scotty Braun did a great job of selling these teams. I just feel like 87 wins is about where I had them, and I think they can make the playoffs. I think now they've, they've touched it. They want the whole thing, and I don't know that they're necessarily going to win a ton more games, but I think they're going to be a playoff team. And when you have the names that you said in there, like a George Kirby is – I have him written down on my sheet of guys to watch, and it is – I'm excited to see what he does this year. I think he's a pitcher – that's only going to get better because he's got Zach Gallon, Zach Gallon type of location with elite stuff, and I think he's going to be that type of American League type of guy. So you have an ace that's going to that's going to hold down your rotation. I think Luis Castillo still is an ace, so I agree with you. But that is a tough division to win 89, 90 games in. Is it, though? That's my one thing. Is it a tough division to win 89, 90 games? Like, the Angels are okay. They're not great. Uh, the Rangers are still building up, in my mind. I don't think they're there yet. Is there a prop bet? Is there a prop bet that we can get? This might be the highest winning percentage division in baseball? 
Really? You think this is the best division in baseball? No. Oakland, no, no, Oakland's no. terrible. No, Oakland highest, is terrible. I just, I just don't think they have – like other, other divisions have like two, maybe three below average teams. AL me, East. AL East. High. High. Besides okay. Boston, we but don't know gonna, what's going to go on gonna there. Anyone else going to be bad? Yeah, but they don't play each other as much now. Not at all. I get it. I get it. But if you look at these teams, Texas is built to win. Los Angeles wants to win. Whether they're going to or not, they yeah. want to win. And you're you're down on them. So I'm higher on them with Todd selling me. And Seattle's definitely a playoff contender. And you have the World Series team. I just think, I just think even if Boston, let's say AL East, even if Boston is brutal this year, they're gonna they're going to beat the crap out of the Yankees. Not beat them, maybe not win, but they're going to just – there's so much like – they're just going to get after each other every single game, even if Boston is a 10 games below 500. Where, like, in this division, I just think – I don't know. I, I just think – I think they might be sneakier than people let on. So here's my thing. I'm writing this down because I want to start making a list and, and, and Claudia, our super Please producer, do. is going to help us with this too. Anything that we start getting after it on, besides our just straight up picks, we're going to keep tabs. So winning percentage, AL East versus AL West. We'll keep track this year, Kratzy. That's my thing. I'm, I'm not saying it's a terrible division. I just think Oakland's bad. Angels, eh. Texas, not there yet. Seattle, good. Houston, good. So they've got two good teams out of five. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm one adult beverage in, so I'm aggressive right now. <laughs> uh, I got to check what was you. in my LaCroix. It's hey, I'm also – no, I know. I'm also excited because this is how we want to finish off, at least for my slap pans. It's slap pans on a Friday. This is how we finish every show, a little high five action. But let me, uh, let me give a little props to a guy that joined us – what was it, Wednesday? His name yes. is Miles Michaelis of the St. Louis Cardinals. He's one of the best interviews in the game. He's – Super smooth with the hairdo and the mustache, and he'll give you innings. Last year, back on track after dealing with the injuries. Played for Team USA. Gave us some great lines. He's hilarious. And he's way richer. Way richer now. Two years, 40 mil on the extension. And we debated the Cardinals' starting rotation for a while yesterday. This is really one of the rocks of the rotation. He's a guy now who's adding two more years to the deal, and, and he's going to be that senior member of that rotation. Derek Gould, the first to drop it. So, yeah, I see the mustache sign right there from Kratzy. I mean, hey, props to, to Miles. The Cardinals probably saw him on the interview, and they were like, Yo, this that's dude's going to beat up Lars Newtbar in his gold medal unless we give him some more cash. That, that's what I was going to say, dude. You come on the show, good things happen. Votto getting a double the night after we talked to him. Um, oh, what was the other? There was a couple other instances that happened. Stubbsy with a rocket. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes, and now all of a sudden, we talk about financial advice. All of a sudden, my man is getting paid again. So congratulations to him. Well-deserved. Get on this show, man. Miracles do happen. Watch out. Maybe maybe that's why he was flying down the left lane in that, yes. in that easy pass lane in Florida, the FL fly lane. You know, he was just like, I know this extension's coming. They've been, they've been talking about this extension the whole time I was at the WBC. I'm feeling good awesome. and that mustache hey if you're getting 20 million a year i might i might not go barnsey style i might go with the mustache i might go mm -hmm. michaelis mustache it, it might be a thing we got to get miles back on because he's the guy i've been i've asked this to like three people this week and nobody's given me shit on an answer i'm like you sign a big deal what do you do what's your celebration are you, no, you, you love at, that. You minimum, love that question. it's a bottle. You absolutely love it. Yeah, because I think that's something on the inside people want to know. And I've spoken to plenty it's of players though. that are like, "Yo, I had a night. We went out with the fam. We got we got wasted, or or we just had a great time. We stayed out till three, four in the morning. We just celebrated life because I worked my ass off to get to this point, and now I'm a millionaire." But, but here, here's the thing: you, you, you're when I've been in those situations. I, you know, I didn't sign a monster deal, but I signed the two years. I think eighteen million dollars, whatever it was, which is a substantial amount of money. But you were exhausted because you go back and forth. Your agents calling you back and forth, left and right. Hey, they want to do this. What do you want to do? Uh, they're they're lowballing you here. They're you know this and that, and you're going back. And then finally, when it's done, you're like, oh God, finally. What do you want to do, hon? Ah, uh, nothing. I'm just glad it's over. You know that kind of some. That's what happens with some people. So I. I feel for them that say they don't do much, 
But also, if you can get out, I mean, if you have kids, it's tough. What do you got? You take the kids to Chuck E. Cheese? I, I don't no, know. No, Fraze, get out of here. It's called a babysitter or, or call up mom or dad no, or whoever's, I want, whoever's I want the, watching the kids. I want the family. I'm a family guy. I want everybody involved. No, Absolutely. But, yeah, Absolutely. but you do the fam dinner and then you go out and get a drink with, with your wife afterward and say, hey, Touché. cheers. We Touché. fucking I agree. this. I agree. I think, I, think part of it, I think part of it too, Scott, the one side is like very few of these guys are going from league minimum to 70 mil. Yeah. They're, they're working their way up to those contracts. They made 10 mil last year. They made, And so I think it's relative. But to me, you got to celebrate. I, I, think, I think life is too short. You got to celebrate the great things. Shoot, me and my wife celebrated when this show got solidified. We've been talking about it for a year. It got solidified. Absolutely, we celebrated. Amen. Thank you. Exactly. You got to celebrate the good times in life, right? You got to actually recognize the achievements. That's that's our life advice right here. So that's my <laughs> thing, Frage. If if you sign a big deal or whatever it is, right? Hey, we ne- we talked about you the other day. You know, you're doing a little Yes Network action. You just joined this. You're a big media star now. You got to at least, even if it's at home, right? You got a great backdrop. You, you just little little cheers, even if you got the cough going on and and For it's sure. uh and it's H right. two O or H two Bro. All I'm saying is just understand where others like some people just don't do it like. Rob Thompson, the other, like, you could see it on his face. He looked exhausted, by the way. Love the guy to death, but, yeah, you know, we just hung out, had a dinner, you know. That's what some people do. Yeah. Well, ha- hanging out, having a dinner is fine. Just make yeah. sure you do a nice toast and say, hey, I appreciate the friends and fam that have been with me through this because it's tough living. Let's do a military base and, and Kratz hats, and then I have one thing left for slap hands. If we get to 1 o'clock on the dot, I'll say it, mm. um, and then we'll be off at 101. So, Military base of the day, Bluegrass Army Depot, U.S. Army uh, Joint Munitions Command Storage Facility located in East Central Kentucky. East Central Kentucky is Reds fans, right, Frisch? Reds fans. Let's go, baby. Um, And then Kratz Hats take over for us. We got the gray. I think there's going to be something nice, though, logo-wise. What do we got? Oh, yeah. Pretty unique logo. We got the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. Can you see what that is? I know you're eating this, Scott. This is one thing that you can't eat. Yes, it is. It's bacon. That is a nice stick of bacon right there. Lehigh that Valley hat probably Iron sells bacon. well, right? This is they have shoot, they have whole like they have a whole uniform where the pinstripe going down the side is a bacon strip. Instead of like I mean, it, they 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 play the whole bacon, the whole bacon train all over it. It is it's tremendous, uh, but Lehigh Valley, I don't pigs. It is the place to be. Second, second highest revenue minor league team in all of baseball. Who's number one? Does I think like know? Sacramento or something like that. Really? Hey, they, the Dayton Dragons sold Dayton out. Dayton does well. Do you remember they went like fifteen or twenty years? <laughs> They were like of the most sold out games. It was a lot of like, games. Well, I don't think it was twenty years, but it was No, no, it was it was it was close to twenty, yes. I've got two, close. Nashville and Vegas, because both of them might have big league teams within the next five years. Both of those ballparks get packed. Mm. Yes. I, I mean I, the Iron Pigs, they pack it out. All the sweets sold every single game ever all year long. What is it like? 172? Games. I think they actually play a few more. I'm not. It was 144 games in AAA, but now I think they play a few more because they're paying them a little bit more. That's impressive, though, because you can drive to a Phillies game. How far does it take to get to a Phillies game if you're in that area? Hour. Hour. Hour 15. It's super yeah. easy. Right up the northeast. That's impressive. Extension. Because the fact that they sell like that, because that that's tough. I mean, you have to talk someone into or just have that vibe that you want to go to a game like that instead of driving over to see the Phils play, that's impressive where, yeah, if you're in Vegas or Nashville, I mean, there's nothing close. So imagine, you're, you're imagine, going to minor league baseball. Imagine in the minor leagues going from the sellout crowds and then you get called up like, yeah, I'm excited, moving from high A to, or low A to high A, and then you got 15 people in the crowd. So, <laughs> Kratz, you, you've been through all that crap before, man. That's You're like, oh, it's great. The weather's great. I'm in Sarasota, Florida. And you got 15 people and you can, you can hear everybody talk. <laughs> How about you're, you're on gonna... the Durham Bulls and then you go to the Rays? Fair. Yeah. Durham, Durham gets some crowds and it's it's energetic, but you're in the Florida State League, Todd. Boy, you can't you don't want to be standing there too long. You're no. you're running through cleats and batting gloves because you're just sweating your face off. Kratzy, let me read this to you. The the Dayton Dragons 
broke the record for the most sold out games in 2011 with 815 games beating out NBA teams. Um, this is from uh, Michael Fanjoy, a huge Dayton Dragons fan uh, who told the News Center. So the Dragons were the hit back in the day and yep. still are. No doubt. The Dragons broke the record for most sold out games in 2011 815 yes. beating out an NBA team. Mm hmm. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Even and thinking that's a, about and like, that's a low A. That's low A. It, well, it's, it used to be low A. I, st I don't know what it is right now. Yeah, they shifted it all around. But Cleveland, how many games did Cleveland sell out in a row when they first opened? It was called Jacobs Field at that time. Yeah. They were selling out. It's still up on the board. I thought that was like 600 some, but it was like five, crazy. five, six years in a row. Just. And and lastly, grand finale, because now it should be up. I'll double check it. Let me just make sure it's there before I blurt it out. Actually, it doesn't really matter. If you're on the show, you get inside access. Yep, it's there. So, breaking news. And this doesn't happen often. The Chicago White Sox, giving a little love to Pierzynski. He's going to be thrown at the first pitch oh, Jesus. at the uh, home opener. So, they threw that out there. And then, I think later in the day, they'll tell people... If you follow AJ, because, you know, he needs the help and he's very entertaining. It's actually, no, but seriously, a really creative way to do it. Because teams sometimes with one of their, you know, veterans that people love, they'll they'll say, hey, Pierzynski's on Twitter now. Give him a follow. They're doing it in a unique way, giving a lot of money to charity. So check that out. If you're not following AJ, it's worth it just, just to take money out of his pocket alone and hand it over to some charity. So I think he's got like a buck per follower up to at least 25 G's. Like that, that's, that's good stuff there. Yeah. Do you guys on know both that? on Instagram and on Twitter? I think it's total. I think it's total. It's, it's whatever the number gets to capped at, at 25 K to white Sox charities. I'm all about it. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting nice. in a part of his home right now with him not here. So that's that's generous, generous, generous Eric, you gotta, you gotta find somebody to throw out a first pitch to opening day. Now, man, you're the only one. Yeah. Me? Frazier's is going. I got the Reds, baby. Opening day, first pitch. Let's go. Listen, I'm throwing BP every day for four groups of these kids whacking the ball all over the cage and all over the field. So I don't. I'll catch your first pitch. Invite okay. me to. Well, I didn't play for either of your teams, so it doesn't mm. matter. I. Uh, why don't you come up to Lehigh Valley? I'll catch the first pitch. They have like 23 first pitches in the minor leagues too. Do the Pudge Rodriguez throw it from home plate to second base? Oh. Thing would break. See ya. I love that. Hey, before we get out of here, are we showing it or, or, or can we jump? I know we were working on showing the tweet on uh, on YouTube, and then AJ can can flaunt it to his friends all weekend. His fancy Orlando friends, how the White Sox are giving him love with their one million Twitter followers. But I will say this seriously, because we've been on social all of us. AJ is obsessed with Twitter now, and oh, he's on he's starts. on it all that's day. Awesome. Plus, he's opinionated. I told him. I mean, when, when I first met him, I was like, no social media. He's like, nah. I was like, you would like it, dude. You're so opinionated. And I'm like, you're doing games. Because he does, he mostly does games. He used to do the studio stuff a lot for Fox. But now he's at the game. <coughs> you can inject your opinion in the games. But you're also talking about the game. You're documenting the game. There's only so much time for you to, to mix in your opinion. Now he's got a show to blab on for two hours. But I was like, Dude, you're watching a game at night and you get heated about something or a fan says something dumb. I was like, you played for almost two decades. Get after it. So it'll he's take, loving it. It'll take over his life. That's the thing. It's it like is. A drug. He's got time though, Fresh. He's fine. Yeah. He doesn't have little ones. You know, he's got time. He's chilling True. watching games. So I said, hey, interact with the people. Joey Votto gave him social media advice the other day. Fresh, we didn't, we didn't have yes. you on that day because we did the interview the night before and then ran it. But... Vado was giving him social media advice. I mean, he was like, hey, connect with fans. If you want to be genuine and talk to fans, which AJ definitely does, he wants to interact with people, then you're going to love it. So he did. And we do have the tweet. We'll show it in 30 seconds. Oh, there we go. This just in, breaking news. Pierzynski's throwing out the ceremonial first pitch on April 3. And then look out later for the little uh, charity announcement. The donation coming from AJ based on the followers. So he'll hey, easily gonna, hit that. We're going to have to break down my pitch versus his pitch here once Ooh. we once I get back. I think that's going to be a fun little segment. Todd, can we yeah, can we do that on the not. field uh, in the lab downstairs? We'll show his form and yours. Whatever you want to do. But I, 
I've been throwing really well to my 9U team, and I, I, I feel like I'm going to throw an absolute dart, and the catcher's going to be like, right there, boom. <laughs> I, I mean, Todd, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it, but I've already talked to the Reds and the White Sox because I knew both of you guys. They didn't want me to catch it, so that's not happening. But they're going to give us the the radar gun's going to be on for both of you guys. So okay, whoever good. throws it harder, that's that's perfect. Wow, I can't wait. I, can't I wait. would love that. No, seriously, and make sure we make do sure that. we talk to AJ. Get him on the mound. I'm going straight to the mound. We'll get him on the mound. Oh, F for sure. The shirt or the hat, whatever. Cleats or no cleats? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna I'll, I'll wear some golf shoes. How about that? So I there can you go. A little bit. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Let's go. What a Friday. Thanks for watching. Thanks to the billion guests that joined us this week. Another big week coming up next week. We do this Monday through Friday on FT Live, 11 a.m. Eastern time, only for a few more days. Then we move a little bit further back to the afternoon to accommodate our players and their schedules during the regular season.